I work in Amazon as a delivery guy, and this happened to me in my earlier years. I was heading to my last delivery for the night. Thunderstorm and lightning was making it tough to drive. I checked the address and found it was on the outskirts. I've never been to this part of the city before. I knew that without the GPS, I would be completely lost. I was about to take a left turn when a huge bolt of lightning flashed nearby and heavy rainfall started to take place. Damn it. It was becoming very difficult to drive amidst the thunderstorm, so I slowed down and waited for the rain to stop. After 15 minutes of waiting in the car, the rain finally reduced to some extent. As I was running late, I knew I'm not going to get a tip on this order. I reached the destination after driving for 20 minutes more. There stood a two-stored wooden house in the middle of nowhere. I took the package and walked to the house porch. I rang the doorbell. The house was in complete darkness, which made me a bit worried, because it would be a total bummer if the owners are not home. I waited for a while. Seeing no response, I got a bit irritated and rang the doorbell once again, but still, no one answered the door. I was thinking to call my boss and return home, when suddenly I heard footsteps walking towards the door. Within a few seconds, a man opened the door. He was an average height, bony guy with really wide eyes. He just stood there, didn't talk, didn't say anything, just watched me. Um, sorry for the delay, sir. Here's your package. He took the package from my hand and smiled weirdly. Okay, I'll take your leave then. I turned back to return to my car when the man stopped me. Would you... would you like to come in for a birthday party? This was a really weird request, so I refused to say. Oh, uh, no thanks. I have to drive a long way back and it's already late. None of my daughter's friends turned up on her 10th birthday. It would have been nice if you joined us for a treat. I felt bad for his daughter. Also, the guilt of delivering the order late shut down my rational senses. I thought, what harm will come if I stay for a while? After all, this is my last delivery of the night. Come on in. I won't keep you long. <laughs> As I entered the house, I realized there's no electricity. There were candles on the shelves, creating a spooky atmosphere around. I followed the man silently. The house was so quiet that I could hear our footsteps on the wooden floor. After walking for a few seconds like this, we stopped in front of a door. The man pushed the door and it creaked open. We entered a big room. A flash of huge lightning struck outside the glass window on the opposite wall, and an eerie feeling grabbed my heart. There was a big dining table in the middle of the room. There were dishes on that table covered with lids. Candles were lit in this room too, but there was no birthday decorations. The ambiance was nothing like a birthday party. There wasn't even a birthday cake. I was looking around when the man appeared behind me, screaming, Happy birthday! <laughs> Jesus, what the hell? <laughs> I like joking around. Why don't you take a seat? I'll go bring my daughter. We'll have a grand meal tonight. The man left. I sat down on the chair nearby, but something in the back of my mind kept telling me that I shouldn't be here. But I couldn't just leave, so I waited for the guy to come back. I decided I will stay till the girl cuts her birthday cake. Five minutes went by, but the man was nowhere to be seen. I was about to get up and look for him <laughs> when I heard a muffled groaning sound. All this time, I didn't notice that there was a door on the other side of the room. The sound was coming from behind that door. I slowly walked to the door and tried to listen carefully. Someone was groaning in pain, but his voice was very low as if he is falling unconscious with the pain. I twisted the doorknob, but I found it locked. I crouched down to look at what's inside. As I peeked through the keyhole, my heart started pounding in my ears. A man was tied to a chair and he had no eyes. His eye sockets were hollow and blood was dripping from them. Not just that, his legs were chopped off from his knees. My God, I've stepped into the trap of a murderer. I immediately stood up and turned back to leave. What's the rush package, guy? <laughs> the creepy man hit me with a shovel on the head, and I fainted on the ground. When I came back to my senses, I heard a happy birthday tune playing in the background. 
but there was also one other sound. The sound of flesh being chopped and cut off. I slowly opened my eyes and found myself tied to a chair, sitting near the same dining table. The eyeless guy was sitting right next to me, and now he was dead. The creepy man was holding a bloody heart in his hand and smiling at me. Why are you doing this? <laughs> because I have a different taste in food. The freak placed the bloody heart on a plate on the table. He then started to walk to each dish and uncover their lids. You want to know what's on the menu for dinner? He took the first lid off, and I saw a pair of eyes placed with salad dressing. He then walked to the next dish and took off its lid. There was a pair of human feet roasted and garnished on that plate. <laughs> now, one of my signature dishes. The man lifted the third lid, and there were two limbs braised in gravy. I realized it was all a lie. This man has no daughter. He's a psycho cannibal, and this is how he hunts his victims down. Please let me go! What have I done to you? I screamed. I can't let you go. You're my main course for this evening. The man picked up a saw from the floor and started to come at me. I screamed and pleaded, but he just laughed. I just have a different taste in food. Why is it so hard for you to understand? I screamed one last time as he lifted his saw over my head. Just then, I heard a loud bang. The psycho fell on the floor as the cops shot him in the head. I don't remember how they got me out of the house. I probably fainted once again. It came to know that the eyeless guy was a detective investigating mysterious disappearances in that area. He unraveled the mystery by finding this psycho killer and informed the cops. The cops traced his phone and found this cannibal's house. A dead man saved my life that day, but I still shake in fear when I recall the psycho telling me, I just have a different taste in food. Hey guys, I see many of you commenting on my videos that this channel deserves 1 million subscribers. But I also see the percent of people who watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel. So, if you like the content, want to support my channel, and want to see this channel reach 1 million subscribers, or maybe 500,000 subscribers, then go ahead, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. This happened when I first started babysitting. My parents were drug addicts, which didn't leave me any option other than working part-time jobs to save up before I move out. I was coming home from a car wash gig that my friend got me. After waiting for nearly half an hour, when my dad didn't show up, I started walking towards home. As I walked, the dense woods on both sides of the road created a spooky vibe around me. I was about to take a left turn when my eyes went to a big tree. Something was stuck on that tree and the wind made it rupture. I walked close to it and saw an advertisement for a missing person. The advertisement looked frail. Underneath that, I could see another page. I pulled off the missing person pamphlet and saw an ad for a live-in nanny. I wasn't sure I should apply for it or not, so I took the pamphlet with me. I thought I would decide after reaching home. When I got home, I saw smoke coming out of our kitchen window. I immediately rushed in and found my mom laying on the kitchen floor unconscious and my father passed out on the couch being high as a kite. They were both lucky that I reached home in time, or else our house would have burnt down, taking my parents with it. I got the situation under control and woke up both of them. That was the first time I screamed at them. You guys are sick. You know what? Don't have kids if you can't even stand straight. I bolted to my room and started packing my bags. The next morning, I called the client and luckily I got the job. I got into a cab and started towards a new beginning. After continuing on the highway, the cab driver took a right turn and we reached near a dusty road leading into the woods. When the car reached near a huge iron gate, I finally realized how rich these people are. It wasn't just a house, it was a mansion. I pressed the button on the gate and a man spoke from the microphone attached to it. Please wait. It took a few seconds more and the iron gate slid making a rustic metallic sound. 
An average height old man dressed like a housekeeper came towards me. Welcome to the Whistling Woods residence. Please, come with me. The man took my luggage and started to walk towards the house. I followed him while wondering how huge this property was. A beautiful marble fountain stood in the middle of the green, mesmerizing garden area. Walking on the artistic path made with white pebbles, we reached the front door. The man twisted the doorknob, and I took my first step into this gigantic house. I saw a tall, handsome man, probably in his late 40s, standing near the intricately crafted wooden stairs and smoking a cigar. He exhaled clouds of smoke and said in a deep voice, I am James Harshaw. You must be Bethany. My wife has talked to you earlier. Yes, thank you for having me. Mr. Harshu smiled and said to the housekeeper, Take Miss Bethany to her room. He then turned to me and said, Go with him and freshen up. We will meet you at lunch. I nodded my head and silently followed the old man. The house was so silent that I felt embarrassed every time my footsteps made a creaking sound on the wooden floor. My room was downstairs on the left, across from the living room. I have never been to such a luxurious bedroom before. The soft pillows and huge bed made me uncomfortable to even lay my fingers on them fearing. The housekeeper kept my bags near the table and said, Lunch is at 12.30. Please, press the white switch if you need anything. After a soothing hot shower, when I reached the dining room, I saw Mr. Harshall was already sitting there. The table was filled with food and some of the dishes looked out of my league. I sat down and he said, there comes my wife and our son, Noah. I turned and saw a frail, petite woman entering the dining room with a creepy doll. The doll was dressed like a gentleman. I said in a low voice, Um, I don't see your son, Mr. Harshall. He gave me an embarrassed look, and Miss Harshall spoke in a squeaky, loud voice. Are you blind? Here's our son, Noah. And placed the doll on the chair opposite me. I felt extremely humiliated and blind at the same time. I said in a fumbling voice, Oh, um, I'm sorry, Miss Harshall. I didn't, I, I failed to notice him. The entire lunch went like a nightmare. At first, I thought it must be a prank or something, but no. Miss Harshall was actually treating that doll like a living child. She talked and chuckled while feeding the doll soup. I could barely eat. Soup and chunks of food were dripping all over the doll, but Miss Harshall didn't even bother. Her behavior pointed out that she was mentally unstable. No one said a single word the entire lunch, and I realized it was a huge mistake coming here. After lunch, Miss Harshall took me to her son's room and handed me a list. Every day you must follow this schedule for Noah. If you miss a single duty, he will get very angry. And the last thing you will want is an angry Noah. My heart started beating faster as I could believe my eyes. This woman is completely insane. I took the list and headed to my room when I met Mr. Harshall on the way. He apologized for his wife's behavior and finally revealed what the hell was wrong with that woman. Two years back, Miss Harshall gave birth to a baby boy. They named him Noah. When the kid was one years old, he crawled down his crib and came near the stairs. Before anyone could catch him, the kid slipped and rolled down the sharp, edgy stair and died. Since then, Miss Harshall lost her mind and grabbed Noah's favorite toy, claiming her son is still alive. Mr. Harshall heaved a sigh and said, hmm, Believe me, Bethany, I hate pretending in this insanity, but I have already lost my son. I can't lose my wife. I felt bad for the couple, and being out of options, decided to play along too. I started taking care of the doll, as in Noah, following the list I was given. I woke him up in the morning bathed him, changed his clothes, and even took him for a walk in his stroller. But as time went by, weird things started to happen. One night after dinner, I took the doll to his room for his bedtime. The last duty of the day included singing a lullaby to Noah, and the list had a strict mention that I must finish the entire lullaby before leaving him for the night. I continued the charade for almost a week, but on the fifth night, I finally gave up. I was tired from putting all my energy into caring for a doll and wanted to go to bed early. So I hummed some lines of the lullaby and then got up to leave. I threw the doll inside its crib out of frustration and turned off the light of the room. As I came back and laid on my bed, I couldn't help but think how long I would be able to put up with this nonsense. Thoughts were going inside my mind and I fell asleep. Don't remember the exact time, 
but I woke up feeling small fingers tickling my feet. As I opened my sleepy eyes, I saw a black figure sitting on my bed in a crawling position. I said in a drowsy voice, Please let me sleep, Noah, and turned to the other side, just when the figure giggled in a very spooky manner, and I sprung on the bed. I switched on the bed lamp and found myself alone in my room. What the hell did I just see? I got up from the bed, drenched in sweat, and went to the washroom to splash water on my face. With the first flash, I heard Miss Marshall's voice outside and peeked from the bathroom window. Miss Marshall ran into the woods screaming. No, baby, no! Come back to mommy! I ran immediately outside thinking she's having a breakdown. I saw her going to the left side of the garden, so I ran in that same direction. Her red nightgown blinked in the dark, and without giving a second thought, I followed her into the woods amidst the middle of the night. After a certain point, I kind of lost her in the dark and stood clueless wandering in those woods. There was no one around me. The hooting of the owls mixed with the howls of the coyotes made me feel like I have stepped into a world where I don't belong. I turned back and got face to face with Miss Herschel. She stood like a maniac with bloodshot eyes staring right into my soul. Grabbing me by my shoulders, she screamed at me. What did you do? What did you do to make him angry? I told you to follow the list. Why didn't you listen to me? She turned towards the dark woods and screamed in pain. Noah, darling, come back to mommy. Mommy will take good care of you. Miss Herschel, please control yourself. Your son is not alive. You have to accept it. Please stop this madness. What are you saying? Can't you hear his cry? Listen. I was going to say how sick this entire thing was, but my lips sealed right away. Behind me, a cry of a baby took place. The entire forest shook with that angry yet painful sobbing. The echo of the cry made my head throb in pain and my heart exploded in horror. But I couldn't move. I stood there as the psychotic cry got louder and louder. Miss Herschel laughed like crazy seeing my numb face. <laughs> Look, now she believes you are alive. <laughs> are you happy now? Look what you did to my son. You made him cry. I turned around and saw a child standing some distance from me holding that doll. The child had no eyes. Darkness poured from his empty sockets and black vomit came out of his mouth as he expanded his jaw almost to his chest. I screamed at the top of my lungs and fainted on the floor. The housekeeper found me unconscious in the woods the next morning. I had a high fever and Mr. Harshall called my dad from my phone. My parents came and picked me up from their house. I didn't speak, didn't go out for a month. I never talked to my parents about what happened there and they also never came to discuss any of that. I guess they were just glad that they found their daughter alive. Till today, I often wake up hearing that angry cry of a child accompanied by Miss Harshall's voice. Noah, baby, come to mommy. I'll sing you a lullaby. <laughs> I drove an ice cream truck for a couple of years. I am the kind of person who never stopped at one place or at one job. I kind of did everything I could to earn money to travel the world. After a part-time job at a local restaurant, I was getting bored in a small town. I was planning to go out and get on the roads. I had this one friend from school who told me she has got a permanent job as a chef in California. I remember she had an ice cream truck, so without wasting any more time, I asked her if I could rent that from her to make some money. I won't lie, she not only gave me the truck forever, but didn't even take a single penny from me. So, with an entrepreneurial attitude, I started my mini business. I had no idea that I always had a knack for the food business. I started to travel in that truck and sell ice cream for a living in the entire Oklahoma area. I renovated the truck with my hard-earned savings and started a new chapter in my life. I generally stopped near playgrounds and schools in the evenings. The fun part of the job was to see kids chattering around me with excitement and laughter. After a month, I became familiar with the kids. I remember every little face to whom I sold ice cream. It was a warm summer afternoon, also a holiday. Expecting the children to come early to the park, I started driving the truck to the location. When I reached the park, I saw children have started to arrive. 
I pulled the truck under a tree near the sidewalks and rang the bell attached to the truck. They all gathered around the truck and started asking for their favorites while raising a dollar with their tiny hands. It was like feeding 1,000 tadpoles in a small pond. I was busy distributing the ice cream when my eyes went to a little boy sitting at some distance. He was sitting on a green bench while keeping his head down. It seemed really odd that amidst all these active kids, the boy was on his own like this. Almost every kid in the park took ice cream from me, but that boy didn't even turn around once towards the truck. I thought, maybe he has no money. So I decided to give that kid a chocolate cone for free. I turned around and prepared a cone for him, but when I looked back, he was gone. The empty bench lied there. I got a bit sad and started to clean the truck before moving on to another spot. I was cleaning the floor of the truck when I heard a small knock on the order desk. I turned around and saw that it was that little boy who was sitting on that bench a few minutes back. He was standing near the truck, but his head was still down. Sun was about to set, so the area under the tree got a bit darker than usual. I couldn't see his face at all. I asked in a cheerful voice, Do you want an ice cream? Without moving up his head, he raised his small hands toward me and said, A strawberry cone, please. His fingers were dirty and there were mud under his nails. It seemed like he dug the ground with his small hands just a few moments back. I gave him the strawberry cone, but refused to take the money. But he didn't move away. He just stood there like before holding the dollar on his muddy hand as it dangled in the air. The kid's body language felt very weird to me. I have never seen such a calm and extremely quiet kid like him till now. I took the money and the kid took his strawberry cone and turned around to walk away. Hey, what is your name? He stopped and without turning around replied, Mom told me never to talk to strangers. I have to go home. She's waiting for me. He then walked away. I got a bit surprised seeing this kid's obedience towards his mother. Such a well-behaved kid, I thought to myself. That night after coming home, I still couldn't stop thinking about that child's unexpected behavior. I decided to go to the same park tomorrow and talk to that kid more. The next day, I went there again. As I went on selling ice cream, my eyes kept scanning the park for that little boy the entire time. At a point when I realized he won't come today, I started to pack up for the day. I was putting the ice cream tubs inside the mini fridge when I almost gasped in fear. A small dirty hand was resting on the desk of the truck. It didn't take me a second to realize whose hand was that. Jeez, you scared me, I said in a relieved voice. The boy stood like before, holding a dirty dollar in his hand while keeping his head down. I said, now, we are not strangers anymore. You can tell me your name. He said in the same emotionless voice. I'm Mikael. Well, hello, Mikael. Do you come here alone? He nodded his head slowly from up to down. I handed him his strawberry ice cream. As I went to take the dollar from his hand, my fingers ran over his index finger and his dirty nail came off, revealing the red flesh underneath. Oh God, you are hurt. You need help. I said seeing this vicious sight, but without saying anything, the boy turned around and started to walk away. It seemed like he didn't even feel the pain when the nail came off. Drops of blood laid on the desk and I watched the boy walk away as if nothing happened. I couldn't hold my curiosity anymore. As soon as he went behind that tree, I came down and started to follow him. The boy was walking towards the left corner of the park that was now in complete darkness. This side was also covered with vines and weeds. I had no intention of scaring the child, so I maintained my distance and watched him secretly. After walking to a big tree at the end of the park, he stopped under it. The small lamp on the other side of the road gave me some light to that corner. The boy crashed down on the road and started digging up the soil with his small hands. He dug without stopping. His nails and fingers cut open with the pressure. Raw flesh and blood came out of his wounds as he went on. But I still couldn't see his face. I was thinking to stop this child from hurting himself like this when the boy placed the ice cream in the pit he just dug up and buried it with soil again. I couldn't watch anymore, so I came out from the bushes screaming. What are you doing? Are you all right? For the first time, the boy lifted up his face towards me. On that warm summer evening, I felt a gush of cold wind shivering down my spine. The kid had no eyes. Instead of his eyeballs, dark hollow eye sockets stared at me. A painful expression appeared on his face and he said, I want to go home, but no matter how much I dig to come out, I always end up here. And vanished in the air, right in front of my eyes. I fell to the floor with a huge shock. 
My mouth opened in shock and my heart stopped in fear. Sweat appeared on my forehead as I tried to make out what just happened a few seconds earlier. I can't explain how I picked myself up that day and returned home. The next day, when I went to that park, I saw cops near the park and it was sealed like a crime scene. A small crowd gathered on the sidewalk and watched this entire situation. Out of confusion, I asked a man standing in the crowd, what's going on here? He said in a restless voice, they have traced a missing kid from last month. It seemed like someone abducted this kid for ransom and later murdered him. An old woman came to jog in the morning when her dog dug up that ground under the tree. That's when she saw a small hand lurking beneath the soil. Look, look, there he is. I followed the man's eyes and saw the paramedic taking away a corpse of a small child dressed exactly like that little boy. The corpse had no eyes, which supposedly got eaten by maggots. The body has been there for months, so its rotten smell made the air heavy. Everyone covered their nose and some even walked away to avoid vomiting. It came to know that the boy's babysitter brought him to the park and later abducted him, asking for ransom from his parents. When they threatened her, saying she will never get away with this, the cruel woman strangled the boy and buried his body under that tree. The most shocking part was the kid was alive when she buried him. He fainted with the trauma and pressure on his neck, but when he regained consciousness, he found himself buried under the ground. He tried to come out while digging the soil, but choked to death during that struggle. His nails were all broken as he suffered silently. Now I actually understand what that kid meant when he said, I want to go home, but no matter how much I dig to come out, I always end up here. The poor kid's soul was trapped here for a month, and all he wanted was to go home. I hope this kid is finally resting in peace. And to that babysitter, may she rot in jail for her entire life. My wife and I went to Japan for our honeymoon. I'd studied there for a while during college, so I knew the language pretty well, and we were financially stable enough to afford it. We had planned on exploring all of Tokyo. Being one of the largest and densely populated cities on the planet, it was almost like a world of its own. A country within a country with diverse districts that might as well have been their own towns. For the first four days, we visited almost every part of the city, from the anime and manga shops of Akihabara to the trendy department stores of Shibuya, to some downright bizarre themed cafes in Harajuku. But after spending so much time in the crowded city, we decided that we needed a little change of scenery. There were a bunch of parks in Tokyo, but they were all crowded by people who had the same idea. We wanted to take a proper hike in a forest to clear our minds after all the excitement in the city, and the closest national forest was a Okigahara, a place most famous for people going there to commit suicide. Needless to say, we decided to go somewhere else. But with the way things turned out, it would have been safer if we had went to the suicide forest instead. On the fifth day of our honeymoon, we took a train ride to Kyoto, a city famous for its adherence to ancient Japanese culture in contrast to the modern metropolis that was Tokyo. We found a mountainous forest with a hiking trail of the rural area and set out to appreciate the natural beauty of Japan. The rough path took us up the mountains. Flanking us on either side were towering green bamboo trees that made the vibrant purple and pink of the occasional wildflower, or sakura blossom, all the more striking. We walked the path until late in the afternoon, at which point we decided it was time to call it a day. But on the way back, something among the bamboo caught our attention. A fox was watching us from the bamboo forest with blue eyes that almost looked like they were glowing in the shade. This wasn't the typical red fox you could find all over Japan. Its fur was smooth and a shade of shiny silver I'd never seen on any animal before. Naturally, we both took out our phones to take a picture of the anomaly of nature. The moment we did, it darted back into the bamboo forest. We knew it was a bad idea, but the color of the fox was so beautiful that we couldn't help but try to follow it for a picture to show off to our friends back home. The fox was fast, but not so much that we ever lost sight of it. We were able to glimpse the back of its unusually big bushy tail as it scurried in front of us, gracefully darting in between the bamboo trees as we clumsily tried to keep up. We arrived in a clearing in the forest where a traditional Japanese cottage sat next to a waterfall that led down to a flowing river. We didn't even question why it was there or who would be living there. We were just relieved that we found some semblance of civilization after almost becoming a statistic. I knocked on the wooden pillar next to the rice paper door and shouted out a greeting in Japanese. Almost immediately, 
The door slid open and I was met with the second most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life, next only to my own wife. She was a fair-skinned Asian woman with coffee-brown, almond-shaped eyes and a flawless, delicate face that most women could only achieve through Photoshop. She wore a fine silver kimono, fitting for our equally traditional house, and greeted us with a small bow. Good evening, she said in Japanese. How may I help you? Her Japanese was fluent, but I could tell that there was a bit of an accent to it. It wasn't any regional accent I knew. If I had to guess, she kind of sounded like a Korean person trying to speak Japanese. We got lost in the forest, I replied in my own heavily accented Japanese. Can you please help us? She gave me a smile that made my heart flutter against my will. Certainly. However, it is getting dark and the forest is dangerous at night. Would you care to stay the night here until tomorrow instead? I can lead you out of the forest then. I translated the conversation to my wife and we agreed to stay over. She introduced herself as Hana and even offered to serve us food. I tried to decline, but she insisted, and both my wife and I were hungry from our hike anyways. The food was some sort of meat with rice, accompanied by clay cups of green tea. Though we tried to mind our manners, we ended up scarfing the whole thing down in minutes. It was one of the most delicious meals I'd ever had in my life. She then led us to a small guest room and laid out two small futons for us to sleep on. My wife fell asleep almost right away, but I couldn't for some reason. It was odd, since she was usually the light sleeper and I've literally slept through storms before. I felt an inexplicable urge to get out for some fresh air, so I did. I quietly exited the guest room. To my surprise, Hannah was still awake in the living room. More of the same food she'd served us from before was still on the low dining table and she was in the middle of eating it. I hastily apologized for the intrusion in stuttering Japanese. She told me that it was all right in the same soft, polite tone she kept since we met. When she told me to sit down so that she could pour me some tea, I saw no reason to decline. I won't go into detail about what we talked about. Long story short, she tried to seduce me as my newlywed wife was sleeping right in the other room. My hormones screamed at me to take her up on her offer, and I felt my body burning with an almost supernatural compulsion to take her then and there. However, it was all drowned out by sheer disgust at the thought of cheating on my wife. I declined her offer to sleep with me in no uncertain terms. She didn't seem angry about it. Instead, a look of surprise spread across her face. Do you really love her that much? She asked me. Of course I do, I replied. I wouldn't have married her otherwise. There was a tense moment of silence between us. At that time, her surprised expression turned to a look of sorrow. I almost felt bad about making her like that, but nothing was going to make me betray the trust of the woman I loved. I really do like you, Hannah said before standing up, which is why I have to ask you to leave. What? I asked surprised. Right now? Yes, she said firmly. Just follow the river downwards and you'll find a small town there. Don't worry. No harm will come to you, and the moon is bright enough to light your path. Go now. Take your wife and get out of here. I didn't dare question her with the way she said it. There was a strong tone of authority in her words that made me not want to defy it. I could have sworn that her eyes glowed blue in the dim light as she spoke, too. I went back to the guest room and woke up my sleeping wife. I told her that Hannah just asked us to leave, and we had to go now. She gave me an earful for getting us kicked out, but stopped when we returned to the living room. Hannah was nowhere in sight, and instead of the cozy cottage we'd arrived in, we were instead greeted with a derelict ruin covered in dust and cobwebs. Lying on the corner of the lifeless living room was the corpse of a man with strips of his flesh torn out of it, the cracked bones beneath him. His cheeks had been completely removed, revealing only toothless gums. When we looked at the low dining table we'd been eating from just hours ago, we realized where all that meat and teeth went. And the bowls that Hannah had served us, were white teeth and bone shards, topped by strips of flesh that still had human-like skin on one side. And in those clay teacups was a foul black-red liquid that gave off a pungent metallic odor that could only come from days-old blood. We left the cottage, which had become a desolated ruin in Hannah's absence. With no idea of where to go, I led us down the river as per Hannah's instructions, and true to her word, we arrived in a small town where we met some very surprised people. They told us that the abandoned cottage up the river was cursed and that no one who'd gone there had ever come out before. They told us how lucky we were to still be alive and contacted the authorities to get us back to our hotel in Tokyo. We cut our honeymoon short after that night. 
My wife is still recovering from the trauma of what she saw in Hannah's cottage, but I'll be with her all the way. Hannah would probably approve too. Had I not been faithful to my wife, I doubt she would have let me leave her cottage alive. I had acute insomnia. The feeling of being awake when the whole world is asleep is terrible in one word. So to cope with that, I took a job at this mental institution as a night guard. They offered the job and I accepted straight away. Filled in a couple of forms and that was that. It seemed perfect. If I was going to be awake anyway, I might as well get paid for it. It wasn't difficult. My duties consisted mainly of walking through the softly carpet halls every hour or so, checking that the security doors were locked and helping myself to as many free cups of coffee as I could. There were always two nurses on call in case of a medical emergency, but they mostly slept through their shifts, so I barely saw them. My contact with the patients was limited. There seemed to be perhaps 15 or 20 of them, with some there for extended periods and others coming and going on almost a daily basis. I only ever saw them when they were asleep. It was strange seeing them like that, robbed of all context. They could have been bankers or beggars for all I knew. In the staff room, watching over the half-drunk leftovers of other people's coffee and dog-eared magazines was a bank of CCTV monitors wired up to the patients' rooms so that the staff could keep an eye on them whenever they needed to. I spent most of my time there when I wasn't patrolling the corridors. It was oddly relaxing to watch all these strangers sleeping peacefully in their beds throughout the night, stirring gently every so often as they dreamed their unknown dreams. It gave me comfort to watch them all lying there, dead to the world, with me as their silent custodian. Among these patients, two to three suffered from somnambulism, that is sleepwalking. Well, the doctors let them be on their own until they come out to be an immediate threat. Honestly, unlike other mental institutions, the patients here were too old to show violent traits. Also, the windows were bolted and made of toughened glass, and all exterior doors were kept securely locked. I used to come across them in the halls and corridors, sickly patients, whispering to themselves while they performed odd and jumbled actions. One night, I was walking down one of the usual corridors, echoing with the sounds of snoring of the patients, when I came across one of the usual sleepwalkers. An old woman, swollen and red-faced, wearing blue pajamas and an odd pink dressing gown that flapped open as she walked. She seemed entirely unaware of the world around her. As I approached, she stopped facing her back at me while standing near the pale white wall. She was as motionless as a statue, with her face only millimeters away from the damped wall. Suddenly, she spoke as I tried to walk past. You are gonna do a terrible thing. I stopped myself and gazed confusingly at her thin gray hair dangling in the air slowly. I'm sorry, she said again. You are going to do a terrible thing. In that same thousand year old voice, are you talking to me? There's no one else here. That was true, but usually, the sleepwalkers are too wrapped up in their own nocturnal fixations to register other people, let alone speak directly to them. This was something of a novelty. My curiosity was piqued. What do you mean? You are going to do a terrible, terrible thing, and there will be no one to blame but yourself. You should probably go back to bed. The woman chuckled very <laughs> creepily, and I felt my heart skipping three times faster. What do you think you're doing here? She asked without turning her face at me. I couldn't help but laugh while saying, <laughs> I work here, looking after you guys. You really think you can just walk into a job like that off the street? In a medical facility of all places? There was no way she could have known about that. She went on saying, is it very plausible? Is it? In fact, when you think about it, nothing about this place really adds up. You really haven't thought this through. I just stood there staring with the wonder and a sense of discomfort rising in my chest. Maybe I was hallucinating again. I have to go. I mumbled, unsure of what else to do. My palms were filled with sweat. I walked down the corridor, breathing an inward sigh of relief, turning back to this weird woman. Her downright confrontational behavior made me question, was she even sleepwalking in the first place? I went to the staff room with a cloudy mind. I was surprised to see one of the nurses at the table, a fresh cup of mud brown coffee steaming in front of her. 
She too sat facing her back to me. The patients are lively tonight, I said. You can't hide from things forever. It was the exact same voice I heard a few moments back from that patient's mouth. Sooner or later, you'll have to face reality. And the longer you leave it, the worse it will be. It felt as though an electric shock had rattled through my body. I ran around the table to see her face, but when I did, I found that her eyes were closed and she wore this sanguine expression of someone lost in a deep and dreamless sleep. There was a very disturbing grin residing on her meditating face. Small bubbles were forming at the corner of her lips. Just then, the bank of TV screens on the wall behind me fizzed and crackled, lighting up the cramped little room with a brief flare like a flash of lightning from behind a dark cloud. I turned to face them and saw blood dripping down from those CCTV screens. But one by one, a picture flickered into life on each of the monitors, each showing a different scene in grainy black and white. It took me a moment to resolve the overexposed images into recognizable shapes and figures. On each screen, the camera showed a human figure standing in the hallway while jerking his head and entire body in a possessed manner. All at once, every screen exploded, creating a huge collision. In the chaos of motion, I could see all the patients standing right in front of me with wide-eyed and panic-stricken faces. Their mouths were stretched open in silent screams. It took me some time to notice inside their mouth, all of their tongues were cut off. There they stood like statues. I screamed saying, What the hell? Why are you doing this to me? None of them replied. Suddenly, that woman whom I met in the hallway came out from the dark corner and stood in front of my face. For the first time, I saw her, and in that very second, I recognized her. She has been my first victim. She was the first person enlisted in my list as I set out to be the nocturnal creature, killing poor people to cope with my insomniac, maniac mind. But, but, but you are dead. What is this place? I don't want to be here. Slowly, I started recognizing each one of these patients. They were all my victims once murdering them in the most brutal way possible, landed me up in this mental institution. I would have gone to lifetime imprisonment or hanged till death, but I forced my lawyer to set up my case in a more cunning way. I told him to present me as a mentally sick person in front of the court. I thought it would be easy to spend time in an asylum than going to prison. But now, now, I don't want to be here anymore. I am sick and tired of being scared in my sleep. I wake up every morning drenched in sweat inside this small room bolted up with the toughest metal bars. I haven't seen the world outside for days. Now I wish if I have just died with capital punishment. What is the point of living like this? I screamed and woke up in my bunk again. It was another nightmare. Same as last night. I rushed to the iron bars and grasped them with all my strength. Please, kill me! I don't want to be here anymore! Just kill me and set me free from this place! I heard two guards standing near my cell and saying, Again? This patient is getting annoying day by day. The other guard replied, Well, this is what happened when you are locked up in a freak house with the realization of murdering 12 people without mercy. This sucker deserves this. No matter how much I screamed or pleaded, no one came to help me. I screamed and screamed and eventually, tired myself out. The entire day went by, and when the guard passed in the food tray after leaving for the night, I realized the impending doom is coming back again. Soon, I'll pass out and join my night guard job in this freak house. It's hard to imagine ever leaving. I try to stay awake, but I never succeed. Even though I know some terrible nightmares are awaiting me on the other side of sleep. After graduating high school, my sister and I decided to go on a trip to the countryside. We decided to book a B&B &B for a more comfortable stay. Even though Riley was only some months older than me, she never failed to make this impression that I am the younger one, hence I must listen to her. Her controlling nature did irritate me at times, but she cared a lot for me, so I never argued with her on this matter. We chose a small cabin located in the woods. The main reason to select that place is that we were right next to a beautiful waterfall. 
we thought it'd be an idle setup for our vacation. During the day, we hike to the waterfall and enjoy a stay in nature at the same time. Driving amongst the vast cornfields while relishing the sweet chirps of birds in the wilderness calmed my mind. I rolled down the car window and let the cool breeze play with our hair. Riley turned on the music and started to chat. We were talking and laughing. In a few words, we were having a good time. After driving for two and a half hours, we got onto a dusty road surrounded by a dense wood. The shade provided by the bushy big trees created a mysterious ambiance. Riley lowered down the volume and said, Can you hear that? I asked. Hear what? The sound of water falling from a cliff. We are almost there. I accelerated seeing a crossroads. According to the GPS, our destination is on the right. Riley was right. The B&B is probably 15 to 20 minutes from here. When we finally arrived, the cabin looked exactly like it appeared on the website. Tall pine trees were guarding it. A hiking trail went into the woods from its left. We got out of the car and gave the owner a call. The owner told us that we will be on our own here and the key is under the mat. Riley opened the door and we got inside. The cabin was cozy and neat. A small living room was attached to the kitchen on its right. Across the living room, there were two bedrooms. One had a view towards the hiking trail, while the other showcased the horizon accompanied by the pine trees. I chose to stay in the second one. Waking up to a sunrise seemed more appealing to me. The only small discomfort was the washroom. It was located outside the cabin at the backside. The thought of coming out of the cabin in the middle of the night to use the bathroom kind of spooked me out, but Riley was cool with it. But there was no other way, so I went to take a shower while Riley got busy arranging the kitchen. We brought everything with us. I twisted the tap and the shower head started to pour cold water. I was shampooing my hair while humming in a cheerful mood when a weird feeling took over. It was as if I wasn't alone in this bathroom. My eyes were covered with shampoo so I couldn't open them. But then I thought, it's nothing. Just my tired mind making silly imaginations. I started to wash my hair when my hand touched the back of my head and shockingly, I felt someone's hand on me. I cleaned my face as fast as possible and opened my eyes to take a look around. There was no one in there except me. I checked the door lock and everything was fine. I assured myself, saying, the exertion of the journey is playing with my mind. When I came back to the cabin, I saw Riley was cooking lunch. So, enjoyed the shower? She asked with a smile. I gave a fake smile and said, um, did you go there to call me or something? Me? No, I was cooking for us the whole time. Why? Nothing, I kind of spooked myself in the shower. Don't worry. You'll get used to it. I know the washroom setup is a bit weird, but many cottages have this feature. Also, you can wake me up at night if you feel scared to go there alone. I can protect my little sis. <laughs> Shut up. Cook your food. I didn't say anything more to her because she was already mocking me for getting scared. I, on the other hand, also thought it was nothing and it's better to let it go. After a tasty lunch, Riley and I decided to walk around a bit. The sun was about to set, so we didn't take the hiking trail as it would be risky to come back after dark. We were wandering in the woods when my eyes went to a tower-like structure. What is that? I pointed it out and started walking towards it. Riley followed me with a confused face. Pushing aside bushy trees and wild saplings, when we reached in front of the tower, I realized it is a grave. The tower was a marble epitaph built of the grave. Jeez, who would bury their loved one in a spot like this? Riley said. The epitaph read, to my dear wife, Arane. Hope she is in peace now. There was nothing else except this one statement. Why didn't the owner tell us about this? This is not nice, I said in an upset tone. Come on, Corey. What's the point of telling your guests there's a grave nearby the cabin? I mean, think about it. No one will agree to come here then. Yeah, because staying in a forest cabin which has a grave nearby can be quite disturbing to normal people. She laughed at me for behaving like a kid. But as I stood in front of the grave, the moment in the shower flashed in front of my eyes. Something in the back of my mind kept telling me we should not be here. I wonder how she died, Riley said. She started to inspect the tombstone while circling it. The sun was setting in the sky, turning it red and orange at the same time. Birds were going back to their nest and the night creatures of the woods were waking up. One thing that disturbed me even more was the last half of the epitaph. Hope she is in peace now.
What does that mean? Did Lorraine have a troubled life? What kind of troubles? Why wasn't she at peace when she was alive? I drowned in my thoughts when I heard a rustling sound behind me. I turned around and Riley jumped on me screaming. Boo! Not funny, Riley. I got furious and started to walk towards the cabin. Okay, I'm sorry. You're being serious for no reason. She followed me while apologizing for her sick joke. We got inside and after some time, I forgave her. I had to because after a point, her apology started to annoy me. The night fell and we started drinking to relax and forget about this grave. Drunk Riley talks a lot. She was going on about her ex and why things didn't work out. I chose not to answer her as this ranting will eventually tire her soon. After a hell of a lot of drinking, neither of us could stand straight. Right before going to bed, I felt the urge to pee, so I grabbed a flashlight and came out. By that time, Riley was already dreaming in her bed, and even though I was feeling scared, I didn't wake her up. As I walked towards the washroom, the sound of forest became crystal clear to my ears. I heard owls hooting and coyotes howling the entire time. I sat on the toilet seat and began to do my business when I heard footsteps outside. I encouraged myself saying it's nothing. After finishing, I was locking the washroom door from outside when my eyes went to a bush nearby. In that pale moonlight, I saw a woman standing near that bush. I couldn't see her face well, but even in that dark, her eyes were glowing like a hyena. Who, who is it? No reply came. Riley, is that you? I'm sick of your, sick of your silly jokes, you know. The woman took a step forward and a ray of pale moonlight fell on her body. For the first time, I noticed how enormous her belly was. What the hell? Why on earth was a pregnant woman lurking in these woods at this hour of the night? I shouted to her. Are you all right, miss? Do you need help? But she just stood there watching me with her freaky glowing eyes. I remembered I have a flashlight with myself. I took it out from my back pocket and pointed it in her direction. Where did she go? There was no one except me there. I rubbed my eyes and looked around and didn't see any sign of her. With a confused mind, I came back to the cabin. I opened the door and somehow dragged my intoxicated self on the bed. I decided to sleep on this matter and tell Riley about this the next morning. I don't remember when I passed out, but around three in the morning, I felt a touch right next to me. The room was in complete darkness. I moved my hand on the other side of the bed when I felt someone was lying beside me. I thought, maybe I've entered Riley's room in the feet of drunkenness. She was lying too close to me, giving me barely any room. So I tried to push her away without waking her up when my hands touched her belly and I felt a wet liquid getting smeared all over my hand. Riley, did you pee or something? Gross, man. Why the hell do you drink when you can't? Saying all this, I turned on the bedside light and jumped from my bed as soon as I noticed my hands. My hands were drenched in thick blood. The smell of it made my entrails churn anti-clockwise. I looked at the bed and saw a dead woman lying on it. Her throat was slit, making her vocal cords hang out. But the actual horror unfolded as my eyes went towards her belly. No doubt, this is the same pregnant woman I saw earlier in those bushes. Her belly was cut open too. The small hand of her baby can be seen hanging out of the belly. I can't explain how terrifying that entire sight was. Suddenly, the woman turned her eyes at me and blinked twice. I collapsed on the floor, screaming at the top of my lungs. We left the cabin the very next morning. When Riley heard my scream and came to my room, she found me unconscious on the floor. I never told her what I saw that night, but as time passed, I made research about that cabin. I even connected with some localities to find out what exactly happened there. What they told me still scares me to sleep. Many years back, a couple lived there. They were having a happy life until the husband started to suspect the wife of having an affair. Out of anguish and frustration, one night, the husband killed his wife. She was eight months pregnant at the time. The husband was a very sick man. He didn't just rest after murdering his wife and the unborn child. He built them a tomb too. I don't know if he's still alive, but I had a huge brawl with the B&B owner for renting a haunted cabin.
It happened in her French hometown on the Western Front during World War II. A unit of German soldiers had come to lay siege to it after steamrolling through every other town on their way. The town managed to resist thanks to the uneven terrain and abundant trees that made tanks ineffective. The attacking Germans had to rely on relatively small artillery instead, though that didn't make things any easier for the defenders. For one, these German soldiers weren't your typical Nazi. They weren't the infamous Waffen-SS. But a few defenders who were veterans of the previous World War could tell that they were a cut above the average cannon fodder. For some reason, they would only focus their attack efforts at night. They shot at the town with guns and light artillery under the cover of darkness from seemingly all directions, leaving the defenders confused and terrified of where the next shot might come from. Those manning the town walls fought half-blind against every attack, unable to spot their enemies in the darkness, save for the brief muzzle flashes of rifles and artillery. The best they could do was try to guess where the enemy were by the sound of their gunshots and shoot back, hoping they'll hit something other than trees. It wasn't a very effective tactic, but it helped hold the attackers back at the cost of blood. After every night, wounded defenders would be sent into an old building that had been converted into a makeshift medical ward. There, my grandmother and other volunteer nurses would patch up their wounds as best they could with what was available. The soldiers under my grandmother's care would often tell stories to pass the time and get their minds off the pain caused by their lackluster medical care. They spoke of one man in the attacking German unit, an officer of some sort who always wore his black dress uniform more fitting for a parade than actual combat. No medals decorated his breast, yet he held an imposing presence that left no question as to who was in charge. He had the eyes of a predator that almost looked like they shone in the dark, and he somehow knew the forest like the back of his hand, commanding his troops through the thicket without issue. The town defenders jokingly started to call him Monsieur Lou, Mr. Wolf in French, because of his fine clothes and apparent mastery of the wilderness. They had no idea how fitting that name was for him. Naturally, being an officer dressed as flashy as he was, Monsieur Lou became a prime target for the defending snipers. However, none of them were ever able to hit him. The split second he heard a gunshot directed at him, he would duck or cover just in time with inhuman reflexes. Meanwhile, the defenders were dropping left and right. Most of the injuries sustained in the siege were actually what you'd expect. Gunshot from long-range rifles, shrapnel wound from artillery bombs, and the occasional broken bone or concussion. Aside from casualties in battle, the soldiers also died in the medical ward from infection or blood loss. However, some were met with a much more gruesome fate. There were nights when the enemy would not emerge from the forest or discharge a single shot. Sometimes, the night would pass without incident, but there were also times when defending soldiers, usually those assigned to isolated patrols, would be found dead the next morning with no sign of the murderer. Their throats and bodies had been torn apart as if some wild animal had ravaged them. The few witnesses were driven mad by what they saw. According to them, a terrible beast killed their comrades before disappearing into the night. Their doctors determined it to be a form of hysteria, a delusion made up by shell-shocked men who refused to believe that a human being, even an enemy, would be capable of such brutality. However, my grandmother found out firsthand that the stories told by those soldiers were all too true. One night, the enemies attacked in the middle of a thunderstorm, allowing one of the defenders to do the impossible. He shot Monsieur Lou. A young private named Gabriel had managed the feat by sinking the sound of gunshot with the thunder. For a whole minute, he had his rifle scope trained on Monsieur Lou's chest and waited for lightning to signal incoming thunder. The moment the thunderclap finally came, he pulled the trigger. Unable to hear the gunshot coming his way, Monsieur Lou got struck by the bullet square in the chest. The attackers immediately stopped firing and made a hasty retreat back into the woods with their wounded commander. Just before they disappeared back into the forest, Monsieur Lou himself shot his pistol back at the town walls one last time. The bullet hit Private Gabriel in the shoulder and he was carried away by his comrades as the hero of the day. Over the following days, Gabriel's shoulder became infected and she got closer to him during that time. Enough so that he confided in her about the death of his wife at the hands of the Nazi. He still wore their silver wedding ring in remembrance of her. They kept in touch after he recovered enough to fight again and on one full moon night, 
my grandmother went to visit him at the town wall. It was one of those quiet nights where the enemy wasn't attacking. Everyone knew that it could mean someone would be found dead the next morning, but tried their best not to think about it. It wasn't like there was much they could do anyways. My grandmother ascended the town walls, knowing that Gabriel was on duty that night. She wanted to give him some pastries that his admirers in town made for him and check on his injury again for good measure. She found him standing guard over the edge of the wall and they greeted each other as friends. She handed him the goods and they struck up a conversation to pass the lonely night. Just as they were about to say their goodbyes, the sound of scratching stones drew their attention. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere below outside. Curious, my grandmother stayed there as Gabriel looked over the town wall to see what it was. The moment he peered his head over the side, a humongous hand reached out from under the wall to grab his throat. Though it shared the shape of a man's hand, it was covered in coarse black fur and tipped with claws that dug into the flesh of Gabriel's neck. My grandmother watched in horror as the thing attached to that hand clawed its way to the top of the wall without releasing its grip on Gabriel's throat. Although it stood on two legs like a man, it was covered in black fur with a snarling wolf-like head and a healed over bullet wound on its chest. Though it looked like a beast, the hatred in its yellow eyes was too human as it slowly strangled the helpless private with one hand. Gabriel tried fighting back, punching the beast in the face over and over again to no effect. Just before another punch could harmlessly connect, the beast opened its jaws and bit down on Gabriel's left hand. There was the sound of crunching bones, followed by the gnashing of meat as the beast swallowed Gabriel's hand and with it, the silver wedding ring. The beast suddenly let go of Gabriel after eating its hand. It made a pained choking sound before letting out a bone chilling howl that drew the attention of everyone in town. The beast scratched at its own throat as it stumbled backwards. It fell outside the walls and landed on the ground with a thunderous thud. My grandmother quickly got to work patching up Gabriel's hand using a strip from her own dress as a tourniquet. By the time she managed to staunch the bleeding, every soldier and half of the town folk had flocked to the walls to see what had caused the howl. My grandmother pointed them to the other side of the wall where the beast fell. But instead of the nightmarish beast that had just bitten off Gabriel's hand, lying in the dirt below was the naked body of Monsieur Lou. He still had the wound from where Gabriel had shot him, and his face was twisted into a look of sheer shock and panic with veins bulging around his throat. The town siege didn't last much longer after that incident. People assumed that the attackers must have lost their nerve after the death of their commanding officer. However, some soldiers reported seeing something strange during the full moon nights. Sightings of a giant wolf with a missing paw tearing apart the German attackers under the light of the full moon. Private Gabriel continued to live in the town, though he was taken off military duty. My grandmother soon left the town to continue being a nurse in a different part of the front, so she never found out what became of him either. I don't know if there's any truth behind her story or not. It's an entertaining story, if nothing else. And now that I'm a soldier myself, I can't help but to wonder if I'll ever get to see something like that too. I have always hate going to the park, and it's not because I don't like nature or anything like that. It's because I can't stand the sight of people playing with their pets. It just makes me want to throw up. Now, I know you might be asking, why would anyone not like the sight of cute dogs and cats? But after hearing this morbid experience, you too will never look at animals the same. My name is Taylor, and this horrific experience happened six years ago. I was 21 at the time, and I had just finished college. It was on a Thursday, and I had gone to the supermarket across from my apartment to buy some groceries. I barely had up to $10, so I bought very few things. As I walked up to the counter, I saw the cashier Jake staring at me. We weren't friends, but we knew each other as I lived close by. As I dropped the few things I bought, he looked at me and said, I don't mean to pry, Taylor, but are you low on cash? I didn't reply as I was embarrassed. He then looked at me with kind eyes and said, it's nothing to be ashamed about, Taylor, but if you're up for it, I may have a job for you. Hearing being offered a job piqued my interest and I asked, what am I going to be doing and how much is the pay? He then told me, we can talk about what you're going to be doing later. And regarding the pay, he then brought out a thousand dollars and handed it to me. I was stunned as I hadn't seen money like that in a while. 
He then continued with, think of it as an advance. But remember, with pay like this, the job is pretty something. He then asked for my number so that he could get back to me with more details regarding the job. A week passed before I heard from Jake. I had already spent $700 of the one grand, so I knew I had to do the job now as I had already spent my pay. But I just assumed it was going to be something like cleaning the supermarket. That night around 3 a.m., I got a message from Jake saying, ready to know what the job is about? I remember telling him, it's pretty late, but sure. That's when he told me to download something called Tor Browser. I was confused, but I did exactly what he said. After that, he sent me a link and he told me, I don't know if you've heard of the dark web, Taylor, but this is a link to the dark web. He then continued with, this link is going to take you to a website where you'll see videos of women eating. Think of it as ASMR, but with a more serious take on it. He then sent the last message saying, this is just to prepare you for what you're going to be doing. And remember, that much money doesn't come easy. You start next week. And with that, he went offline. Now, a little feeling of dread began to creep up as he was acting so weird. And as I clicked the link, I finally understood what he meant as a horrific realization dawned on me. The link took me to a site called All Natural. The first thing I saw was a slogan that read, Welcome fellow true eater. I was asked to pay $20 to see the content, which I did. And when the page finally loaded, it showed videos of women eating raw animals. The first video I played showed a huge man holding a cage, seemed to be filled with kittens. I could hear the animals whimpering like they were scared. The woman in the video sat on a chair and she had a sick devilish grin on her face, which displayed her blood-stained rotten teeth. She looked like she was terribly ill as she looked pale and feverish. The man then took one of the kittens and what he did next made me throw up on myself. With his huge hands, I watched him tear the kitten apart. It happened so fast that I couldn't hear the kitten squeal. He then tossed the carcass of the dead kitten towards the woman, and without hesitation, she began eating it raw. The sight was otherworldly as she ate it whole. I could see the little organs of the kitten spilling out of her bloody mouth as she ate it. It didn't take long before there was nothing left, and the video ended. I screamed and I threw my phone away when the video was done. The noise had garnered the attention of my neighbor who knocked on my door asking, Taylor, are you all right? I didn't want him to know about what just happened, so I quickly replied, It's fine, I, I, I just thought I saw something. And with that, he left. I didn't fall asleep that night as I was deep in thought. I finally understood why Jake didn't tell me about the job before paying. And I understood why it paid so much as over 15 million people pay to watch each video. I knew I had messed up as I couldn't do it and I also couldn't pay back the money. So the next day, I started avoiding Jake and the supermarket. After a week, I thought I had gotten away with it. But as I walked to my apartment that night, I was attacked by two huge men. And the last thing I remember was a white handkerchief being forced onto my nose. I woke up in front of a camera. I was surrounded by bright standing lights, which made it impossible for me to make out my surroundings. A huge man walked in, and with one look at him, all my suspicions were clear, as he was the man who tore animals apart in those horrific videos. And right after him, Jake walked in with a sick grin on his face. Why are you avoiding my calls, Taylor? I was scared, but I immediately replied with, I didn't mean to. I can't do this. Then do you have my money? He asked. Fear filled me as I had already spent half of it, but I said the first thing that popped into my head, I don't, but I'll pay you back, I promise, please, just let me go. I'm afraid we can't do that, he said. So what are you gonna do to me? I don't wanna eat the insides of animals, that's disgusting, <laughs> disgusting. He screamed before slapping me hard across my face. We are true eaters, like the lions we eat the right way, directly from nature. We don't let our meals be tainted by heat, we keep it all natural. Once he was done, I asked him, so you guys are cannibals? And that's when he hit me again. Don't associate us with cannibals, you dumb whore. Me and the 15 million people who tune in to see these videos are much more than that. We are enlightened. We are true eaters. I didn't speak as I was scared to be hit again. And that's when he gestured to the huge man that was standing in the corner of the room. Ivan, it's time to begin. And as the huge man picked up a cage, 
I started to count down the last moments of sanity I was going to have that night. The creature in the box squealed as it was taken out, and when they brought it closer, I could see that it was a huge gutter rat. The animal struggled, but it was hopeless as the man began to pull it apart. It didn't take long before it tore in two. The man walked up to me with the carcass of the dead rat. I tried to run, but that was when I realized I was restrained. He finally reached me and tried to force the carcass down my throat. I screamed and resisted, which led him to hit me. My vision had become blurry, and I felt them force my mouth open and force the furry carcass down my throat. No words can ever describe what I felt, but I felt like I was tasting hell itself as different things that I assumed were the organs of the animal rolled down my throat. I began to vomit profusely, but that didn't stop them as they just continued right after. It took 30 hellish minutes for it to be over, and I just stayed there quiet as I had lost all zeal to fight. They untied me and took me to a small room where they kept me. I threw up all night and I laid there in my vomit. Every night for the next week, I was taken to eat another animal, from sloths to puppies to little birds. Each one was worse than the last. It didn't take long before I began to feel ill. It was on what I assumed to be Friday. I started hearing loud noises from outside, followed by, it's the police. Hope filled me and I was about to say, I'm here. I began to convulse. The last thing I remember that night was being surrounded by cops as I finally passed out. I woke up in the hospital to see my mom, a doctor and my neighbor all standing around me. The doctor began to tell me how lucky I was as a lot of harmful bacteria like salmonella and listeria that are normally found in raw meat were found in my system. I asked my mom how the cops found me and she said my neighbor had noticed I had been missing for a few days and had called the cops which led them to track my phone. I thanked my neighbor Mr. Matt for saving my life. Some cops then walked in and asked me some questions and I told them everything I knew. They then told me that I was lucky as over 70 women were found in the warehouse and half of them were dead. They said the case was still ongoing and they were trying to get to the bottom of it. At that moment, I knew to myself that there was nothing they could do as over 15 million people out there were true eaters and there was nothing anyone could do to fix that. It's been six years since this incident. I moved back in with my mom and even with all the therapy, nothing can ever take away that trauma. I can't eat right as I only eat when it's necessary. I also can't look at animals right because every time I see a dog or a cat, while people see the beauty and the cuteness of these animals, all I really see are their insides. I've never been this scared in my life. For the last few days, I can't sleep, can't eat, can't do anything in peace. I'm a shopaholic and I love purchasing everything online. One of my favorites online go-to shop is Amazon. Half of my monthly salary goes to them. And by now, I think almost every delivery guy from Amazon is mugged up to my house address. But now, I'm scared to buy anything online because someone is leaving mysterious Amazon packages on my doorstep. There's no proper time for their arrival and no one knocks on my door but between every two to three days, I received them. It all started one sunny morning. I just got up from bed and came downstairs to make breakfast when I saw my cat scratching the main door. I've never seen him behave this way. Albert is a lazy cat who barely moves from his seat. What is it, Albert? He went on rubbing his paw on the doormat. I thought maybe he wanted to go outside, so I opened the door and there it was. A package labeled by Amazon was sitting on my porch. I thought maybe it's the wall clock that got delivered early. I found it extremely unprofessional on behalf of the delivery guy. He should have at least knocked to notify me. I brought it inside and kept it on the dining table. For a wall clock, the package felt surprisingly light. Something inside rattled when I picked it up. I left it like that and went to fry some bacon and eggs. After finishing breakfast, I decided to open it up. I cut the first layer of tape with my kitchen seizure, and then the entire wrap came out. It felt like someone already opened it and then put it all back together. I unfolded the cardboard box and peeked to see what was inside. My eyes widened with shock 
is I found a ring of cable wires that had been ripped off from both ends. What the hell? This was the stupidest joke ever. What's the point of putting some worn out cable inside a disposed of Amazon box? And why on earth did someone leave it on my doorstep? With a pissed off mood, I dumped it in the bin under the kitchen sink and left for work. The entire day, I couldn't concentrate on my work. I kept thinking about the package. When I came home, I took a shower to cheer up my mind and ignore the morning incident. I came downstairs and sat on the couch to watch the news. As I turned on the TV, breaking news flashed on the screen. Last night in the 23C block, a woman was found murdered in her house. Her porch window was open from where the intruder supposedly entered the home. It said that she had been strangled with her cable wire, but the murder weapon is missing from the crime scene. Cops are interrogating everyone in the neighborhood about this mystery killer. My eyes went to the kitchen. I could feel a sudden rise in my heartbeat. I slowly got up and walked to the kitchen sink. The package is still lying inside the dustbin. I took it out once again and opened it. The thin white wire no doubt belongs to a cable TV. Is it even possible? Or am I just overthinking things? This all can just be a coincidence intertwined with a stupid joke. Just when I heard Albert growling at the cable wire on my hand. I put it all back but didn't throw the package away this time. I don't know what I was waiting for. I still regret not going to the cops right then. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought the cops might have suspected me if the wire turns out to be a missing murder weapon. Also, the victim's house is not far away from my place. I struggled to sleep that night. All I could think was a pair of hands strangling my neck with that white cable wire. My eyes were bulging out. My tongue was hanging as I was desperate to free myself from the killer's tight grasp. Around 3 a.m., I woke up with a dry throat. I grabbed the glass of water from the bedstand and was about to take the first sip when I heard footsteps in my yard. I sprung out of bed and went to the window to look outside. As I peeked, I saw a figure dressed in black disappearing into the bushes nearby. Was it him? Did he come back? I rushed downstairs and with a trembling hand opened the main door. And there it was again. Another similar looking Amazon package was sitting on my porch. I picked it up while shaking in fear. Who knows what I'll find this time. Albert growled at me, or rather, at the package that I was about to open. I unfolded the box and inserted my hand to pick something that was shining inside. As soon as my hand touched the object inside the box, I felt a warm liquid running through my fingertips. It wasn't water, but rather, something sticky. I turned on the lamp nearby and found myself holding a bloody knife. The blood was still warm, which means another murder has taken place just a few moments back. Oh my god, a killer is dumping his murder weapons at my place. And now both of his murder weapons have my fingerprints on them. I ran to wash my hand and puked on the kitchen sink out of fear and disgust. What should I do now? Should I call the cops? What if they don't believe me? What if they think I'm the one behind these killings? There's only one way out of this. I must destroy these murder weapons. I went straight to the basement and burned the cable wire and the two packaging boxes right away. I cleaned the knife with dishwashing soap and bleach after that. The rest of the night, I slept on the couch in the living room. The next morning, I called sick and took leave from work. The TV news was turned on and I was waiting for that one single piece of news. The morning went by and afternoon fell, but there was no news of a second murder. I was walking in the entire house restlessly when I heard cop cars outside. My heart almost came out of my chest. Why in the hell are they here? I peeked behind the blinds of the window and I saw cops and paramedics in my neighbor's house. Does that mean... But before I could contemplate on that thought, my doorbell rang. I went to an utmost panicked mode. The cops are here to interrogate me now. What if they find out about these murder weapons? I have to speak carefully. I don't want to go to prison for the crimes I haven't done. 
I wiped the sweat from my forehead and tried to act as normal as I could. I opened the main door and saw a cop standing right in front of me. Hello, officer. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name's Officer Brad. If you have a second, I'd like to ask you some questions regarding the murder next door. What? There's been a murder next door? But how? Oh my god. Ma'am, please calm down. We don't want anyone to panic. Can I come in? I yes, please. I made way for him and Officer Brad entered my house. We sat down in the living room and he told me my neighbor, Mrs. Atwood, has been stabbed to death last night. They're looking for the murderer. He asked me if I hadn't seen or heard anything suspicious last night, and I replied not at all. His questions were obvious, like if Mrs. Atwood had any enemy or feud with someone who could kill her for revenge, and my answers were no. I went on pretending like a dumb person who knew nothing about all this. After a tense round of interrogation, when Officer Brad realized I have no useful information to give him, he got up and warned me to maintain high security as the killer can strike again. I walked him to the door and saw him moving to the next house. As soon as I closed the door, I collapsed on the floor with tears. Why me? Why is the killer doing this to me? I couldn't eat the entire day. I drank a lot out that night and passed out on the couch. I don't remember how long I was gone, but my senses sharpened with the sound of the main door opening. I jumped from the couch and ran to hit under the stairs. The door closed and someone walked into my house. I kept the knife under the stairs, which the murderer left earlier. Footsteps started to come close to me, and a voice spoke. I know you're hiding, Kelly. Kelly? My name is Caroline, and there's the only person in the entire world that called me Kelly. Oh my god, is it Mark? Mark was the creepiest boyfriend I ever had. A cold shiver ran down my spine when I recalled how I filed a restraining order on him two years back, and he said to me, You'll pay for this, Kelly. So it's him, the whole time, trying to get his ugly revenge on me. I reached out to my left pocket to call the cops, but discovered I'd left my phone on the couch. Suddenly, a hand grabbed my hair and pulled me out in one painful swift. How did you like my gifts, Kelly? Mark threw me on the hard floor while <laughs> laughing like a maniac. What do you want from me? I screamed while sobbing in fear. Mark gazed at me with bloodshot eyes and said, Nothing. I just want you. And now we don't have any other way than to run away, you know? Go pack your things. We'll leave right now, hon. What? Why would I run away with you? Oh, my sweet, innocent Kelly. Don't you get it? I killed those people and sent you the murder weapons for a reason, you know. You didn't go to the cops, which makes it clear you have tried to hide them. And now you're equally responsible for those crimes as much as me. Tampering with murder evidence is a crime indeed. <laughs> you shouldn't have picked up those Amazon packages, my poor lamb. My head started to throb in pain as I finally understood his evil plan. But this time, I'm not going down without a fight. You crazy freak! I jumped on him and stabbed him with the same knife he stabbed my neighbor to death. Blood started pouring like a fountain and his body trembled like roadkill. I kept stabbing him until his entrails came out from his stomach. I'm now driving to the big lake on the outskirts. His body is lying in the back, wrapped in layers of plastic. I'll dump him in the lake along with the knife and the mystery killer will never be found by the cops. Everyone will know he went underground after two murders and I'll be done with this shit once and for all. I used to be very stupid and reckless in my high school days. Just to get an adrenaline rush, I didn't hesitate to risk my life. I enjoyed the opportunity and attention of girls for being crazy and too desperate. But too much of anything can never be good. That's exactly what happened to me one night, and since then, I have stopped being the risk taker. I grew up in a small neighborhood in the countryside. My eyes witnessed green paddy fields and big bushy trees in my growing years, 
more than any other kids of today's time. At some distance from our neighborhood stood a rusty abandoned building. Many people approached the mayor to demolish that site and build something useful, but whenever workers started working, things ended up in horrifying accidents. First, a worker was found dead hanging inside the asylum. His eyes were bulging out from his sockets. The fearful expression on his face was enough to understand that he surely had seen something extremely scary before death. The strangest part was, no one could find the reason behind his suicide. His co-worker said he was absolutely fine when he came for the night shift. A group of five workers went inside to take a look at the leaking pipelines when this man got lost somehow. They called out for him and eventually thought he left for home. But when the next day he didn't arrive, they again searched the entire building and found him hanging from the ceiling inside a room. No one has the slightest idea what went wrong with him that night. Many people reported hearing screams and whispers from that asylum after dark, even though it has been long abandoned. We grew up hearing about this haunted asylum, and people in our town avoided that place like a plague after sunset. One day, I was coming home from school with my best friend Sam and my then-girlfriend Amanda. Sam started talking about that abandoned asylum. He and Amanda went on rambling about how that place is actually haunted. I told them with a mocking tone, how old are you guys? Six? And then laughed at them for believing in these bullshit theories. What do you mean? All those deaths? The people who saw things there? Isn't it enough proof for you? Sam said. The people who died there died all by accident or suicide. There's no proof any ghost killed them in talking about seeing things. There's a word named hallucination. Amanda said in a surprised tone. You are so wrong. My dad even heard laughter coming from that building one night. I didn't say her dad can hallucinate too because that would have started a fight and I really liked her so I only smiled. But she realized my irony and they both started nagging me with their stupid theories. Being the overconfident fool I was, I told them we should all go there and see for ourselves tonight. Are you out of your mind? My mom would kill me if she knew I went there at night, Sam said in a panicked voice. I laughed harder this time and kind of insulted him for being such a coward. One thing led to another, and we ended up taking a challenge to spend the night there. Amanda warned us not to be so desperate, but Sam and I were ahead of rational senses. We decided to meet in front of the asylum around midnight. Obviously, I had to sneak out after my parents slept, and so did Sam. When I reached the location, I could see Sam already waiting there for me. He seemed too pumped up to prove me wrong tonight. I smiled at him, but he didn't smile back at all. The sound of crickets and frogs singing chorus at the same time created a perfect environment for ghosts to appear. I lit up my flashlight and we started to walk towards the entrance. The place was older than my dead grandpa. I have heard various disturbing incidents used to take place inside this asylum during its active years. Some say a group of mad doctors performed various experiments on mentally deranged patients, which led to many deaths. But they framed the deaths in such a manner that most of them got ruled out as accidents. Some stories went like, a little girl named Lily was born in the asylum and later died drowning in the bathtub. A man named Jesse intentionally grabbed a disconnected electric wire, burnt to death with high voltage electric shocks. Deaths of Civil War soldiers and a patient who was brutally murdered by his roommate were also a part of the history of this asylum before it got abandoned. The building was so vast that it was easy to end up alone despite having company. It was also easy to feel lost amid the maze of hallways and patient rooms covered in peeling paint. There was broken glass all around the floor. Most of the patient's rooms were tattered and messed up with bad excrement and broken pieces of furniture. The beds that once had shackles and leg guards attached to hold down a violent patient was now lying there under thick layers of dirt with reeking bed sheets dirtier than a dumpster. What a mess, I exclaimed in disgust while treading down the long corridor. Sam wasn't saying a word. He was walking quietly, and his eyes were moving here and there, looking for something. I knew he was scared, and maybe regretting challenging me. So to ease up the situation, I said, I have two cans of beer. Want one? Without replying to my question, he suddenly stopped and said, Can you smell that? Smell what? The smell of burnt flesh mixed with years-old clogged water and dried blood. What? What the hell is wrong with you, man? Can't you smell it? It's coming from upstairs. 
I was sure Sam is trying to pull a prank by saying all this gibberish, but I wasn't some easy scare. I said in a firm voice, fine, let's go and check upstairs. Also, you don't need the beers anymore. I think you're already drunk. Normally, Sam would often reply back if someone mocked him, but this time, he didn't. I was stunned by his weird behavior. At some point, I felt I don't even know my best friend anymore. We started to walk upstairs. I was in the front and Sam was coming behind me. The upper floor was no different from the below one. The same long corridor with dozens of dingy rooms spread out on both sides. Cobwebs were hanging all over the walls. As I pointed my flashlight ahead, a huge bat flew over our head. I ducked out of reflex. I expected Sam to make fun of me, but again, he didn't. He kept walking while sniffing the air in a very weird manner. He then stopped near a door and said, Okay, now I know where it's coming from. You know what? The smell I told you about. This is that bathroom where Lily was drowned after being molested, but she got her revenge anyway. The doctor who took advantage of her was also found in that same bathtub the next day. How do you know all this shit? Is it all true or are you just trying to scare me? Why would I try to scare you? Saying this, he twisted the doorknob and to my surprise, I actually saw what it was. A big washroom with a huge worn out bathtub residing at the end. The smell of years old muddy water pierced my nostrils and I realized what smell Sam was mentioning all this time. The only thing that shocked me was how come he smelt the dirty water from downstairs? I was going to ask him that when I noticed something hanging at the edge of that bathtub. To take a clear view, I flashed my light onto it and my skin crawled in immediate fear. I could see a hand bulging out of that bathtub. The hand was bloated and lifeless. Whoever was lying in it had been dead for quite a long time. What the fuck? Whose hand had that been? Is this your prank? I turned back to hurl at Sam and found myself standing in that abandoned asylum all alone. Where did he go? When did he leave? I couldn't even hear a single footstep walking down these stairs. I called out his name out loud, but no response came. Out of panic and fear, I walked to the bathtub and flashed my light on the murky black water once again. I was right. This is indeed a dead body. And this person is no stranger to me. It was my best friend, Sam. His eyes were wide open with an unknown fear. He might have seen something horrible before taking his last breath. His face and body were blowing up, being drenched in that water. I rushed home in a panic and woke up my dad. I told him everything that was going to call the cops, but he stopped me. Yes, my father made me sit on this matter, as the entire blame could be on me. Now you know why I am not brave anymore. I am the weakling friend who sat on his friend's unnatural death to avoid strict interrogation. Sam's body was found by the cops three days later after searching the entire town. Amanda knows I couldn't meet him that night due to my parents' pressure. Everyone knows Sam went to the asylum and died like every other person there. I am sure he planned to show me how brave he was by going there before me, and that's what made him never come back. It still scares me to sleep when I think. I was there all the time with Sam's spirit while he was floating dead in the tub of stairs. Honeymoons are meant to be a time of love. A time to enjoy the woman who just said yes to you. A time to finally look back on and remember. But mine turned out to be the worst experience of my life. My name is Noah Michael, and this is my story. It started on the 17th of July, 2007. Me and my lovely wife, Adriana, had just had the best day of our lives. We were also planning on going to the best honeymoon ever. And after thorough planning, my wife had suggested a place called Hearts Crossed Lovers. It was an island resort that was out of the country, and she said she'd seen it in a magazine a while back, and she thought it'd be the perfect place for us to start the rest of our lives. I remember saying, the review said there's so much love in the atmosphere, you could literally die. I wasn't really into the location. All I knew was that if we were together, I would be happy. So we boarded a plane the next week, and we went to the island resort. We reached the island resort and the place was beautiful. 
Everything from the atmosphere to the hotel to the activities. Everything really screamed love. We settled in and began the best week of our lives. We did numerous couple activities as we enjoyed ourselves. I remember telling her, you always manage to find the best places. She smiled at me and then replied, I also managed to find the best person I could marry. I remember smiling really hard at what she said. This is going to be the first of many beautiful moments we'll experience together. We had been at the resort for two weeks, and me and Adriana knew that we'll be leaving soon, as we had only planned to stay for a month. That evening, there was a program for couples that was organized by the natives of the island. When we got there, we were met with other couples, and when the program started, the natives began to dazzle us with their tribal dances and songs. It was truly a beautiful sight. After an hour, the program was coming to an end, and one of the natives took the stage to give the closing remarks. It was a woman, and she said, Now it is time to reveal the couple that Ubu has chosen. I was confused, and I began to ask my wife, What's going on? And she said, Didn't you read the brochure? Ubu is apparently the founder of the island, and every ten years, he picks a couple he has seen that their love is the strongest. I remember still being confused, so I said, What? And she said, It's just a silly tradition done by the natives of the island. As I was about to ask another question, cheers erupted around us, and we looked to the stage to see native island women pointing directly at us, as we had apparently been chosen as the couple of honor. I was still confused, and they began to decorate us with beads and seashells. I called a waiter aside to explain, as my wife wasn't really explaining what was going on well, and he said, It's a traditional thing done every 10 years by the villagers. Once they choose you, you will be taken by the villagers to see exclusive sites around the village and to participate in some exclusive activities. The next morning, the activity started off with a drama acted out by the natives, and it told a story about the founder of the island, Ubu. It said he found the love of his life on the island, and he decided to share the love he found to the island visitors. The narrator said, And the love of his life told Ubu, My heart is so full of love for you, and if I could give it to you right now, I would, as I know this love will diminish within the coming years. So if you could take it, my heart as it is ripe and full of love now, I will gladly give it to you. I was still confused and perplexed at everything that was going on, as I didn't understand the cryptic story. Eventually, it was done, and we were taken around the village to see some sights. We were also given a weird concoction to drink. I was hesitant, but I didn't want to be rude, so I took a little. When we were done, the last place we were taken to was the Diamond Beach. The water was bewitching as it sparkled like glass. After that, the activities were over, and we finally began to make it back to the hotel resort. That night, while my wife slept, I stayed awake. I don't know why, but I felt really uneasy. It was 1 a.m. on the dot when my body fell completely limp. I was aware of my surroundings, but I couldn't move or speak. And that's when I saw them. A square trap door that was situated on the floor was opened in the middle of our room and numerous black figures emerged from the ground. They immediately carried me and Adriana. We still couldn't move, speak, or scream. As they took us down the trap door, we were taken through elaborate tunnels and we eventually found ourselves outside. I saw what looked like little stone altars and we were placed on them and they began to surround us. The scene looked like they were preparing for a ritual as eventually everything went quiet and a woman began to speak. Listen and listen well, chosen couple. You will now hear the full true story of our forefather, Ubu and his lover. As you see, Ubu knew that their love won't last forever as love is fickle and weak. It fades away with time. His lover knew this too. So the only way they could preserve their love was to harvest and cut out their hearts when it's fresh and full of love. So that their love will last forever. So wise Ubu did the needful and he carved out his wife's heart, the same on which we have kept for decades. She then proceeded to raise a jar. I couldn't make out what was in it as I could only see a few remnants of whatever was once in the jar. The woman then continued and said, Ubu then realized that he had to stay to appreciate the love he had been given. So he passed down the teachings to us and we have been following suit as we passed down the love to numerous lovers. Each of them raised a jar of their own and this time I could see clearly preserved human hearts in the jar. 
Some were rotting and some looked fresh. And that was the moment when I screamed. My wife Adriana began to scream too at that sight. I then heard the woman say, The concoction is wearing off. It's time to begin. And with that, she revealed a huge knife and she began to approach my wife. I began to struggle to move but I couldn't ask what they had given us to drink was clearly potent. I watched my wife begin to scream as she told her body to run, but it couldn't. And that's when the native woman lifted the knife and decided to scar me for life. I watched her carefully carve out my wife's heart and it didn't take long before my wife stopped screaming and I saw her dead eyes stare at me. They then proceeded to take it and raise it in the sky. The native woman then said, your love has been preserved and it will be for many years to come. I then saw them use a little knife to carve a cross into my wife's heart. They then poured oil on it and they proceeded to put it in a jar. When they were done, they turned to me and said, Sadly, you aren't as wise or as resolved as Ubu, so you can't appreciate what we have done for you. So, we will send you to be with your lover soon. I didn't scream or fight, as all I wanted to do was die, as I had already died inside when I saw them kill my wife in the most horrific way. They then carried me and my wife's corpse to the Diamond Beach, and they threw us into the water. As the waves carried us farther out, I felt the ice-cold water seep through my skin. And as I saw my wife's corpse float out of my reach, I felt anger fill me as they had taken away the love of my life. I tried to reach out to her body, but I still couldn't move my arms. But I wasn't going to give up. So with all my strength, I reached out to her and I held her corpse right before it was about to sink. I began to pull her as I fought the current. And with all my strength, I began to make my way to shore with her body in my arms. It was the most brutal and strength draining experience, but I did it. And when we finally reached the shore, I collapsed. I began to hear some footsteps and I was scared as I thought it was the native villagers, but it was a receptionist I had met at the resort. He saw me moving and rushed to my side. And the last thing I heard him say before I passed out was, I'll go get help. I woke up in the resort, but in a different room and with a bad headache. I was surrounded by two doctors and a few cops. I immediately asked for my wife Adriana, but the doctor told me to be calm. I began to cry and with tears, I told them everything that happened. Later that day, the village was raided and everything I told them was true. As they found the shrine, the altars, and over 30 preserved human hearts. The investigation took place and it was revealed that the villagers had killed over 30 couples. I was given Adriana's body to bury, and taking it back home to bury was the worst feeling I ever experienced. Fourteen years have passed, and nothing has changed. People tell me that I'm lucky to be alive, but there is no day I don't wish that I had died with my wife, as the only reason I fought was to get justice for her, and even then, it wasn't enough. But even though I still stand and breathe, when those people carved out my wife's heart, they carved out mine as I feel nothing but emptiness in my heart. And I know it's the only feeling I will have for the rest of my life. We all sat down near the fireplace as Grandpa rested his back on the armchair holding a glass of wine. Every winter, my sister and I come to visit him. My grandpa is a retired army general who now lives in these hills owning a small tea garden. I love coming here to relax my mind from the hustle and bustle of city life. My sister Amy lives in Montreal, so she too loves spending some family time here. After our parents died in a car accident, Grandpa is the only family we have. Apart from all these reasons, visiting Grandpa carried a particular purpose. Amy and I both enjoyed hearing about his life experience. His days in the army were filled with terrifying incidents, until today, they gave us goosebumps just by hearing from Grandpa's mouth. Also, he had this amazing ability to narrate those experiences in such a picturesque manner that it left us stunned and speechless at the end. We have heard many incidents, and each stands out to be unique in its own way, except this one that we heard last winter. Picking up from where I began, Amy was sitting opposite of Grandpa, and I was standing in front of the window watching the snowflakes floating in the air. The house was warm, and the dim lights created a perfect environment for a scary story. 
Amy took a sip from her hot chocolate and said, You never told us a horror story, though. You mean stories of seeing ghosts. Do you believe in ghosts, darling? I don't. But do you? Grandpa smiled and looked at me. I said in a firm voice, I don't believe in ghosts either. I noticed Grandpa getting aloof, as if some memory carried back to his mind. No one spoke for five seconds, and all we could hear was the sound of the wood burning in flame. Staring at the trembling fire, Grandpa exhaled a deep breath and said, Well, I can't assure you about the existence of ghosts, because when this happened, I was going through a traumatic phase mentally. So, some can say it was my imagination, but somewhere deep down, it felt so real to me. Please tell us, Grandpa. It will be perfect for tonight, I said excitedly. Grandpa starts the story. Back then, I was posted in a small village in Utah that was being evacuated overnight due to an already speculated attack. We all expected the enemy to strike in the morning, but they started to destroy our base camps right before dawn. On that chilly winter night, we did all we could do to resist their unexpected attack, but many soldiers got injured and many died on the field. I was shot in the arm and would have bled to death on the battlefield if not for my fellow soldiers who saved me and took me to the Army Hospital. The Army Hospital was old and has been there since World War II. Due to the serious injury, I was shifted to the emergency care ward with all other injured soldiers battling for life. Though the daytime went by somehow, the nights were tough to spend in that hospital. The constant smell of medicines and chemicals hit me hard after dark. Two nurses used to be assigned for each ward, holding 50 to 60 soldiers per emergency ward. Some of them had massive injuries like 80% burn wounds or shot in the head but still survived somehow. Some had to be amputated to stop their entire body from going to a septic shock. Screams and cries echoed in the hospital hallway as these injured soldiers withered in pain. I still remember this one soldier who was admitted to the next bed beside me. He lost half his face in an explosion and still managed to survive. He slept all day with heavy sedatives, but sometimes at night, he woke up screaming in pain every time the nurses dressed his wound. The nurse shed tears while removing the blood-soaked gauze from his face. Chunks of flesh came off every time fresh wounds received touch. That day, I felt war is much more about suffering and torture than glory and pride. Anyways, I mostly spent the day in bed even though I was perfectly able to walk. The doctor prescribed complete bed rest after taking out the bullet, so I had to follow his instructions. The hospital often suffered power cuts at night. Now in the middle of a war, <laughs> this was hardly an issue to complain about. Every patient in the emergency ward had urinals attached along the bed so they don't have to get up, and most of them weren't in that condition to do so. But I, on the other hand, was quite better health-wise. So, after a point peeing in a urinal bag while lying on the bed, started to feel a little uncomfortable for me. The washroom was on the end of the corridor across the lot, and I knew the nurses won't let me walk there at night. But one night, I felt the urge to pee and decided to do it like a man. I got up on the bed and looked around. The entire emergency ward was lined up with beds on both sides. Candles were placed in the corner to give light. I saw one nurse dozing on a chair nearby and the other going for her rounds. I thought, this is the ideal situation. Before the nurse returns, I can easily go and come back to bed after finishing my business. Also, not walking for a long time started to hurt my legs. I got down from the bed supporting my arm at the saline stead and stood on the ground. A sense of relief blossomed in my mind. Slowly and steadily, I walked to the nearest corner and picked up a candle to lead my way in the dark. Because the corridors had no light, each nurse carried a candle to make her way during the rounds. I came out of the room and found a vast empty corridor standing ahead of me. The pale moonlight came from the high-rise glass window and created a shadowy effect throughout. I started walking holding the candle gently. The hospital is so big that if I lose the light, I can easily lose my way here. As I left behind the emergency ward, I stepped into a world of darkness and dead silence. The subdued chirping of the crickets outside was the only thing I could hear at that point. I was walking on my own when I suddenly realized someone is following me. I stopped and turned around. 
but there was no one in that enormous corridor except me. I thought it was all my imagination, so I shrugged it off and started to walk again. But after a few seconds, that same feeling of being followed started to bother me. No matter how many times I stopped and turned back, I didn't see any. When I was almost near the washroom, I heard a painful cry. It was as if someone is whimpering in pain. I know the second emergency ward is upstairs and I have to come far away from mine. So hearing sounds from that ward is almost impossible for me. I said in a firm voice, who is it? No reply came and the cry just grew louder. Suddenly, it started to come close to me. I raised my candle in the air, trying to look if someone is coming towards me. Whoever was crying came near me and stopped all of a sudden. Standing in that dark corridor with nothing but trembling candlelight, I felt an unknown fear. I said in a scared voice, Who are you? Do, do you need any help? No reply came, and the cry just grew louder. It started to come close to me. I raised my candle in the air. A rough, painful voice spoke. Uh, I can't see. I thought maybe a soldier got lost in the dark and obviously he lost his vision, so he is trying to find his way back to the emergency ward. I said in a fumbled voice, Um, you, you, you can come with me. I can take you back to bed. Here, holds my hand. I stretch my hands toward the darkness in front of me so that the blind soldier can reach out. I waited, staring at the pitch black corridor. I could hear my own breathing as I waited for this man to find his way in the dark. A second went by. Five seconds went by. But still, there was no sign of him. I was about to walk ahead to look for him when I heard running footsteps rushing towards me. A hand came up from the dark trying to grab my hand and I was almost going to hold it when the owner of the hand appeared in the light as well. I screamed in horror as a disfigured body stood in front of me. The soldier is not blind. The part of his head over his lips was cut off. Blood and flesh was hanging from this vicious wound. The lips moved one last time and said, I can't see. I fainted on the floor right then and there. When I woke up, the sunlight from the window fell on my face. A nurse and doctor stood right next to me and discussing something with a serious face. The doctor gave me a strict warning not to leave my bed. They said they found me unconscious near the washroom after hearing my scream. As long as I stay there, I never left that room, be it night or daytime. The day I finally recovered and got discharged, I asked the nurse about a soldier coming here missing more than half his head, to which she replied, many people died here and it's impossible to keep track of their injuries. But there is a saying in this hospital that those who died a painful death still roam the corridors at night. The souls of these dead soldiers still try to find their way back to life without realizing they have died long ago. I loved ice cream as a kid. I mean, what kid doesn't? I lived in a hot state too, so for kids in my town, hearing the ice cream truck jingle after a day hard at play was like seeing an oasis in the desert. My friends and I always made sure to have a tenner in our pockets in case the ice cream truck ever came around. We all recognized the ice cream man by his face with how often we saw him, and in return, he remembered all our names. Eventually, we learned his real name and started calling him by it instead of Sir. His name was Harry, and he always looked a little worse for wear. He was balding, middle-aged, and almost certainly depressed if his unkept, unshaven face was anything to go by. Still, he was nice to all the kids who came by his ice cream truck and made the effort to remember the usual orders of all his regulars. Every time I went up to him, he'd say, Hey, Joel, another strawberry popsicle today? I'd either reply, Yeah, thanks, Harry, or tell him I wanted something else if I wasn't in the mood for it. I imagine he probably did the same with all his regulars, and not just the kids. The adults were all fond of him too. The merciless heat didn't spare them just because they were grown-ups, and most of them saw nothing wrong with indulging in a sweet treat every now and again. It wasn't uncommon to see a couple of grown adults leaning on the parked ice cream truck, making casual conversation with Harry with ice cream cones in their hands. We all already lived in a small town where everyone knew each other, but Harry and his ice cream was a fixture in the community 
that helped bring everyone together. I think Harry liked having things that way too. Unlike us kids, he was able to get more off his chest talking about his life with other grown-ups. I'd sometimes overhear my own parents chat about how rough Harry's life had been and what a good man is to still be so kind regardless of the fact. I don't know the full details, but I'd heard enough about him from bits and pieces of conversations over time to know that he was divorced and that his son was in prison for some sort of violent crime. I tried not to think too much about it though. It wasn't like I could do much to help him anyways. I was just a kid, and as far as I was concerned, he was just a friendly local ice cream man who everybody liked and will always be there on a hot day to give us a cold treat. Those happy days wouldn't last though. I was walking home late after hanging out at a friend's place. Since everyone in the neighborhood knew each other, my parents didn't really have a problem with 10-year-old me walking the streets alone. It was a hot afternoon and the path back home was long. So I was excited when I noticed Harry's ice cream truck coming up the road beside me. The fact that the ice cream jingle wasn't playing from the speakers like normal should have been a red flag. But at the time, all I could think about was not much. I wanted a strawberry popsicle to beat the heat. I waved down the ice cream truck and waited for it to park. When it did, I rushed over to the side stall, expecting to see the town's favorite boomer. Instead, I was met with someone else entirely. He was a much younger man than Harry, who I'd never before seen in my life. And although he smiled as he greeted me, it lacked the friendly warmth I'd expect from the ice cream man I know. Hey there, kiddo. What are you having? Strawberry popsicle, please, I told him. One strawberry popsicle coming right up. The man disappeared into the truck for a moment before emerging with a wrapped red popsicle in his hand. I took it from his hand and noticed that the clear plastic packaging had become slightly torn. It wasn't an unusual sight. The plastic they used for these was as cheap as they came. What was odd was that I could see the popsicle had already partially melted, smeared the clear plastic with blobs of red. Whoever this new ice cream man was, he wasn't quite as thorough as Harry has been at his job. This is $1.25, right? I asked as I rummaged through my pocket with one hand while holding the still packaged popsicle in the other. The young man held up his hand. No need to pay, he told me. Consider it a gift from me to you. I started to like this guy a bit more after he said that. Gee, thanks. Actually, his eyes darted left and right as if to see if there was anyone nearby. How about I treat you to some more free ice cream in the truck? Why would you do that? I asked, starting to get suspicious again. See, I'm new here in town and I want to get along well with the kids here. So why don't you come inside so we can have a little chat? I'd love to get to know more about this place. Um, no thank you, I told him. I actually have somewhere to be right now. Aw, oh, well that's a shame. The man was smiling, but I could see from his eyes that he was angry. Take care then. He drove off and I continued my walk home while trying to enjoy my popsicle, which was hard to do with how odd it was. Most of it still tasted like strawberry, but there was also an underlying metallic tint to it that I couldn't quite place. In the end, I couldn't even bring myself to finish the whole thing in one go with how strange it was. When I got home, I put the weird half-eaten popsicle in my freezer to continue eating later and went about the rest of my day as normal. The next day, I went downstairs from my room to see the face of the new ice cream man plastered on the news. My parents were both watching it with watery eyes. I was only somewhat shocked to see him there, but I didn't realize why my parents were crying until I listened to the news myself. The young man had been caught by the police in the middle of trying to coax another kid in town into his ice cream truck. They ended up inspecting his ice cream truck for it and found something that left the whole town shaking. Inside the freezer was the bloody body of Harry. His throat had been slit open and he'd been crammed right alongside the ice cream he'd been selling. I realized with horror that the metallic taste I got from that strawberry popsicle the other day was Harry's blood trickling from his still fresh corpse onto the packaged ice cream being sold. The news went on to explain that the young man, Harry's murderer, was none other than Harry's own son. He owed money to someone very violent and was planning to sell his own father's organs on the dark web to pay for it. He was even willing to kidnap kids to sell to pedophiles in those dark recesses of the internet. And if not for my common sense, I could have very well been one of them. The whole town mourned the loss of their friend 
while his traitorous son rotted in prison. Hopefully, he'll stay there for the rest of his miserable life for what he did. I took up babysitting in college to make some extra money. It was either that or a part-time job at McDonald's, and babysitting gave me a more flexible schedule. Being the eldest of four siblings, I was pretty good with kids too anyway, so it seemed right up my alley. While I enjoyed my time working as a babysitter for the most part, there was this one gig that soured it for me forever. The client was a rich couple who lived in my neighborhood. They'd seen my ad in the local newspaper and called me one afternoon as I was lazing about in my room playing video games. Hello, is this Joan? Asked the mother from the other end of the line. I need someone to babysit. Are you available this Friday by any chance? Yeah, I'm free. I got up from my bed to focus on the conversation. How many kids do you need me to babysit? Just one. She paused for a moment before continuing. Well, two, but you don't have to worry about the other one. Can you please elaborate on that? Well, one of my sons is 10. He's the one I need you to look after, she explained. The other one is 17, but I really don't trust him to look after his brother. He's special. From my experience, special is usually a parent's code word for some sort of disability, mental or otherwise. I didn't mind, though. It just meant I'd have to be a bit more attentive than usual. Still, I wanted to know what I was getting into beforehand. That's all right, ma'am. Is there anything I should know about him, though? You don't have to worry much about him. He usually keeps to himself in his room. Just leave a plate of food in front of his room at around 6 o'clock and he'll be fine. We talked a bit more and I agreed to sleep over for the night as she and her husband were out on their overnight trip. Once we settled on a price, I went back to playing video games without a second thought, not knowing what a huge mistake I'd just made. When Friday came, I went to the address the mother provided me on the phone. I knocked on the door and seconds later was greeted by a kind looking couple who introduced me to their young son. His name was Danny and seemed well behaved enough, if not a little quiet. They then pointed me to the room of their reclusive teenage son, whose name I learned was Ryan. Apparently, Ryan lived in their basement. A little odd, but I didn't think to question it. I just assumed he must have liked the lack of noise in the basement. Once they got the ground rules laid down, I said goodbye to the parents and tried to hang out with Danny as best I could. He didn't make it easy, though. He hardly ever made eye contact with me, and whenever he did, I could see a strange sadness in his eyes. I'm nothing if not stubborn, though. Eventually, I got him to open up to me bit by bit by talking about his favorite shows while he drew fan art of them in the living room in colored pencils. I've watched so much SpongeBob, SquarePants, and Sesame Street during my time babysitting little kids that my knowledge of them was near encyclopedic. Relating to quieter kids like Danny is much easier when I'm able to understand their hobbies and interests. When dinner time rolled around, I decided to order us both some pepperoni pizza, much to Danny's delight. When the pizza came, I paid the pizza guy with some money the parents had given me for takeout and brought it inside. Before we dug in, I put two slices of the pizza on a clean plate and poured an ice cold glass of soda for Ryan. I set the plate and glass in front of Ryan's room and knocked on the door. Ryan, I called. I'm leaving your dinner outside your door in case you want it. It's pizza, so you should eat it while it's hot. I heard thumping movement behind the door, so I knew that Ryan must have heard me. I didn't wait around to see him open the door though. If the reason he kept to his room was because of some undiagnosed anxiety disorder, I didn't want to accidentally cause him a panic attack with my presence. People who spend all day in their room like he does probably dislike having to meet new people anyways. As I was walking away from the door, I heard it open and shut behind me. Satisfied that Ryan had his food, I went back to hanging out with Danny while chowing down on the rest of the pizza. We were laughing and joking about his favorite episode of SpongeBob when a look of concern suddenly came across his face. Hey, you all right, Danny? I asked. He looked me in the eye, and I could see that they were watery with a sadness that I couldn't figure out the source of. You're going to stay with me tonight, right? He asked. You're not going to go anywhere? I was a little taken aback by his question and brushed it off as him overthinking because he shouldn't be. Of course I'll be here, I reassured him. Promise. And if you're ever worried about anything, just come to me. I'll be right on the couch until your parents get home. All right? His expression brightened, and we were soon back to talking about cartoons again. That night, I slept on the couch with my phone in my pocket in case the parents called me. Everything seemed normal. Then, out of nowhere, I was ripped out of my sleep 
by a firm hand covering my mouth and nose. I tried to scream, but no voice came out. I struggled to breathe, but couldn't through the unseen stranger's vice-like grip. An arm wrapped around my throat, making it even harder to breathe, and I could feel myself being lifted up from the couch. I was dragged away from the living room, kicking and clawing at my attacker's arm in my attempts to breathe. I felt my nails digging into flesh, but whoever the person was didn't show any signs of stopping. I caught a glance of the basement door opening before I was tossed inside. I tumbled down the stairs and landed on the hard wooden floor on my shoulder. I coughed and gasped for air in an attempt to regain my bearings. When I finally looked up from the floor, I saw what I can only describe as a bedroom from hell. Every piece of furniture looked like it had been made from bone or leather. Not just any bone either. The leg of the nightstand looked like it was made from someone's spine and bones. The leather covering of the bedside lamp had a human face sticking out of it. Even the sofa seat looked like it had been stitched from the skin of a dozen different people. It looked more like a demented workshop than a place any sane person could live in. Blood-stained work tools that must have been used to create the twisted furniture hung on the walls. I turned to look up the stairs and saw a filthy teenage boy with stringy black hair and blood-stained clothes smiling at me with rotten green and yellow teeth. His demented bloodshot eyes were fixed on me as he descended the stairs. Such pretty skin. He grabbed a rusty hammer from his wall of tools without slowing his approach. I can't wait to sleep in it. I finally regained my voice enough to let out a hoarse scream. Not a second later, he grabbed me by the throat again with one hand. Don't worry, he whispered into my ear, his foul, humid breath almost making me puke into my throat. I'll make you into something beautiful. He raised his hammer to strike. I closed my eyes and prayed that I'd die quickly. But the blow never came. Instead, I felt his grip release my neck, followed by a shrill scream that wasn't my own. I opened my eyes and saw Danny standing behind the teenager, holding the same colored pencil he was drawing with that day. Half of it was buried into the teenager's shoulder, causing him to cry out. Seeing an opportunity for escape, I kicked my teenage attacker in the crotch. While he was doubled over in pain on the ground, I grabbed Danny and ran out of the house as quickly as possible. Once we were both safely in a neighbor's house, I called the police, who arrived in a matter of minutes. They arrested the teenage boy, who was identified as Ryan, Danny's reclusive older brother, and they searched his entire basement bedroom. They found what I saw and confirmed what I didn't want to believe. Inside of his room were dozens of furniture made from human bone and leather. Some of the leather was traced back to grave robbing incidents in the area, while some were far too fresh to have been cut from a corpse. Under his bed, they found a blanket made entirely out of human faces. It was missing one last piece in the corner. Had it not been for Danny's help, my own face would have been added to it. Last I heard, Ryan was thrown into a mental hospital, where hopefully he'll stay for a long, long time. This happened to me last Monday when I came back from school. I'm an introvert who has no social life and no friends either. So as usual, when I came back, I got myself some light snacks and got hooked on watching anime. I was so engrossed in it that I didn't notice when it became dark. I was quite bored of watching, so I decided to try something different for once. All my classmates were talking about watching various videos up on the dark web, so I thought to myself, why not? I had no clue about how I may access it, which is why I searched up on Google. I learned that regular browsers couldn't access dark web websites. I needed to download a certain browser that was undetectable from search engines and offered users complete anonymity while surfing the web. Some websites suggested using VPNs while surfing to hide my IP address, and I thought it was wise to do so. I downloaded the suggested browser and started scrolling randomly. I found certain people who had posted videos titled in extremely unsettling words. There were certain forums such as the Cannibalistic Forum, which was about eating people and being eaten by people. Some members even chatted and arranged meetups there to eat each other like, I need someone to eat my fresh meat. I am juicy and tender. I then found a site that was about a woman who couldn't deal with the fact that her babies had been stillborn. It was filled with pictures of dead fetuses dressed up and placed in baby cots. I dug in deeper. My curiosity had gotten the best of me. Disturbing images and videos played before my eyes. I then realized 
that it was legitimate child porn and rape and torture content and it was all over the dark web. It was terrifying. They had live cams too. This was all too much for me. I wanted to stop right away but instead I scrolled unconsciously. I saw certain chat rooms of various titles that had unsettling words such as Midnight Stalking, The Morgue, Live Gore. I didn't believe that these were actually real. I was curious, so I clicked on one. The live stream opened up. It was a dark room, and there was a guy tied to a chair in the middle. Beside the chair was a table. It had various items on it, ranging from weapons to tools like hammers and axes. I didn't know what was going on until a man appeared in a mask. It looked like the mask that doctors wore in the plague, with a long beak that resembled a crow's. In his hand, he held a blood-stained knife. It was then that I noticed carefully that the man who was tied was hurt. He was bleeding and his wrists had deep cuts on them. His blood dripped drop by drop into the small pools of blood at his sides. Should I finish him? The man said in a strange voice. It sounded as if he was using a voice changer to deepen his voice. Was this a stage show? I wondered. I looked at the comment section. Everyone was telling him to finish him. There were comments which were extremely brutal like shoot him in the head, put him in boiling water. But most of the people wanted him to use the axe on the guy. I saw the masked man pick up the heavy axe. My body froze as he raised it above his head and brought it down on the guy who was tied up. The axe got stuck in his head and there was a shower of blood spraying out of it. The man was presumably dead, yet the one with the axe kept striking him over and over again. I could hear his dying screams. I could hear the mushy meat sounds that the axe made where it touched him. The floor was splashed with blood. He did not stop there. He went lower and struck at his abdomen. It was sharpened to an extent where only one strike made his organs spill out into his lap. I actually saw his guts flowing out of him. I was frozen in place, unable to move a finger. I then realized that I had just seen a man get killed. I felt sick and closed the stream. I regretted that I clicked on it. I wanted to close the tab, but it wouldn't close. Instead, it redirected me to another page where there were loads of other disturbing and horrible videos. There were several rows. In each row, there were four to five. What was really disturbing about them was that they were like a series. I kept scrolling, hoping there'd be an exit button at the end, which was stupid. When I finally reached the end, I saw a familiar face in one of the videos of the last row. It was that man the one I had just witnessed being killed. The first image was just him staring at the camera and completely normal. After that, there were pictures of him on the street, then of him sleeping. Finally, there was the video that I had just seen. It had been uploaded just now. When I looked under it, I saw a new row had been formed. The first picture was me staring into my webcam in the same clothes I was wearing now. I got scared and began to press the power button. Then I heard a beep and a notification popped out of nowhere which said, we see you. Finally, my laptop shut down. It had been there three days since then and I couldn't help but look over my shoulder every now and again. One night, while I was trying to sleep, my phone buzzed and I grumpily checked who it was at that time of night. It was a message. It was a video of me. A video of me asleep in the exact same clothes I was in right now. I was frozen in place and couldn't breathe. Then came the sound. From right beside my bed, heavy footsteps went running out in the hallway and eventually faded. Startled, I got up and flipped the lights on. My heart raced and my body was shaking because of the adrenaline rushing through my veins. I was scared to death because someone had been standing right beside my bed while I slept unaware. I hurriedly grabbed my phone from where it had fallen. Quickly dialing 911, I peeked outside to see who it was. There weren't any signals and I had zero bars. Frustrated and scared, I ran outside, conscious of the other person sneaking my way to the lounge. I picked up the telephone as quietly as I could, but all in vain. It was dead. The wire had been cut. What were the odds, I asked myself. The best thing to do, perhaps, was to run out of the house for help, which I immediately did. To my horror, there was a padlock instead of the regular lock. I had never seen it before in my life. What do you want? I shouted at the top of my lungs, half angry and half scared to death. 
Someone grabbed me by my hair and started dragging me. I screamed in agony and told him to let me go. He was huge, and I was thin and weak. I stood no chance. He dragged me towards the basement and ruthlessly dragged me down the steps. I felt like that broke every bone in my body. He threw me on the floor, my head hitting it violently. I blacked out for a few seconds. I felt him tie me up. My hands, feet, and legs were bound. I drowsily opened my eyes and saw him setting up a video camera, turning on all the lights in the basement. That's when I knew who he was. It was a dark web video that he was shooting. Let, let me go, Ple please. He didn't give me time to finish before he slapped my face. He went and got a brick from beside the washing machine and hit it with all his might on my feet. The mushy, meaty sound it made was horrifying. The bones cracked so loudly. I screamed so loud, I'm sure anyone who was awake at the time would have heard me. To stop me from screaming, he hit me on my throat. It was so hard to breathe. He adjusted the camera and started cutting at my abdomen slowly. Hot blood started soaking my shirt and I kept on screaming. He laughed <laughs> maniacally and cut deep at my arm. He kept on going and I could feel the bone grinding as the knife rubbed against him. I could hear it. There was so much blood. He stood up and stomped on my face and kept on doing it until I was almost dead. He came forward holding the knife coming for my throat. Loud sounds could be heard upstairs and two police officers came running down with guns, seizing the intruder. Apparently, some of the neighbors had heard strange sounds from my house and called for help. I was barely breathing and the world grew darker. I woke up in a hospital. Turns out, the intruder was in fact the psycho serial killer they had been searching for. I was the only victim who escaped his wrath alive. I would have ended up on the dark web dead. I love traveling, especially solo trips. Whenever I get the time and end up saving enough, I go for a trip. Some people might think it a bit unusual, but traveling alone gives me a lot of joy. It was like a meditation for me. After a long week of work, I decided to take a break. I always travel in a pocket-friendly manner, so my preferred go-to options are B&B and homestays. A coworker suggested to me a place near the Crystal Coast. After reviewing all my options, I finally selected a house next to the beach. The owner, Matthew Hudson, stayed there with his daughter. They had another house on the same premise. I have stayed with families before, so I didn't think twice before booking it. The day got fixed and my excitement grew every day. I hopped into my car and drove towards my long needed break. One of the craziest things about long rides is you start enjoying the trip even before arriving at your destination. The view was breathtaking. The tall rusty hills stood on one side, and the unending blue ocean on the other side. I stopped at a gas station to get the exact direction as GPS started to malfunction after a point. The empty gas station stood like a deserted island. A man came out. He had a rough beard with a very bad odor. His clothes were very dirty and he stared at me like a petty thief. Without getting out of my car, I asked, can you help me with this address? He looked at the address on my phone and then his face changed. He smirked in a very creepy way and said, take the next left and then to your right. I see, thank you, <laughs> have fun. The way he said, have fun, made me cringe. The rest of the way I kept thinking, this guy has surely given me the wrong direction. But when I arrived near the beach house, I realized I was wrong. The property stood like a fairy tale for travelers. I honked the horn and a man in his late fifties came rushing to the gate. He opened the gate and I parked my car inside. Welcome to my beach house. I am Matthew Hudson, your host. Thank you for having me. He escorted me to the house. The small wooden house was perfect for a solo traveler like me. The balcony outside opened directly towards the beach. I couldn't wait to put my luggage aside and take a dip in the blue ocean. Mr. Hudson was a very well-behaved man. He handed me the keys to the house and said, my daughter's cooking lunch. Would you like to join us? I already bought food for myself, but out of courtesy, I said yes. He left and I swam my heart out in the ocean. I have never felt this alive since the last time I broke up with my ex. Floating on the cold ocean water while gazing at the white clouds rejuvenated me. I went to my room, got ready, and came out. 
Mr. Hudson's house was on the opposite side of the lawn. I knocked on their door and waited. The door opened with a clicking sound, and I found myself standing there face to face with the most beautiful woman I have ever seen in my life. Yes. I, um, uh, Mr. Hudson invited me? Oh, you must be Jacob. Please, come in. Dad is in the basement. I am Molly, by the way. Molly escorted me inside the house, and like a possessed lamb, I followed her. She sat me down at the table in the living room and went to call her dad. We had lunch, and the entire time, I couldn't help but stare at Molly. I thanked God for making me choose this B&B. After finishing lunch, I thanked them and came back to my place. I took a nap and was supposedly dreaming about Molly when I heard a loud gunshot. I sprung from the bed and ran to the porch. I did not doubt that the gunshot took place in Hudson's residence. I opened the door to check on them, just when another gunshot took place, along with a spine-chilling scream. My legs froze as I recognized it was Molly. I slowly walked to their house. I had no arms with me. I peeked from the porch window and witnessed a bloody scene. Hudson was sitting on a chair, except half of his head was missing. Brains and blood were splattered all over him and the white wall behind him. Molly was tied to a chair too, and she was shot in the arm. Blood was gushing out from her wound and she was crying in pain. Two men stood in front of her wearing black masks. One of them threatened her, while the other went on robbing them. I dialed the cops and told them to hurry up. Just when a familiar voice took place. I know he's here. Where is that man? I gave him the directions. We will shoot that dog as well and take all his money and stuff. Tell us where he is if you want to stay alive. He, he didn't come here. My dad and I are the only ones here. Well, I have to trust you it seems because your dad isn't alive to tell the tale anyway. <laughs> oh my God, this is the guy from the gas station. They were planning to rob this place even before my arrival. That's why this freak told me, have fun back then. I couldn't believe how disgusting this man was. I saw a shovel lying on the ground. An idea came to my mind. I threw a rock on the porch and ran to the back of the house taking the shovel. I heard the man yelling, you stay here, I will go check the other cottage. I think this bitch is lying to us. As soon as the man came out, I entered the house from the back window and beat the shit out of the other guy. He fell on the floor with a massive head injury and fainted. I then freed Molly and slowly took her upstairs and locked the bedroom door. You should leave. You can't save me. That guy had a gun. He already killed my dad. He's going to kill me as well. You should not be part of this trouble. Just go from here. But as I said, I fell from her the first time I saw her. And not just that. I wouldn't have left if there was anyone else in her position. I was thinking about what I could do when I heard footsteps storming inside the house. You knocked down my partner. I will shoot you both to death. His running footsteps started to come upstairs. I knew I won't be able to stop him for long, but there's nothing I could do. We were trapped. The man began banging on the door while screaming. Open the door. I know you are inside. I said open it. Molly was trembling and losing a lot of blood at the same time. I knew if I don't take her to the hospital soon, she will bleed to death. I grabbed the shovel once again and went straight to the door. What are you doing? Are you going to open the door? Sometimes, simple is the best way. And luckily, it worked for me. I grabbed the shovel tightly, took my position, and opened the door in a wink. The man on the other side never expected the door to get open so he wasn't ready to fire at the time. I didn't give him a chance either and bashed his head with a strong hit of the shovel. He fell on the floor holding his bleeding head and accidentally dropped the gun. I picked it up immediately and pointed at him saying, one move and you will be gone forever. Next to what happened, you can all guess. The cops came and arrested those two robbers. It even came to know that he wasn't the owner of the gas station. The real owner was also murdered and robbed by these guys. What is even scarier is that this man could have finished me the first time he saw me at the gas station, but instead he played it like a perfect evil mind. But his playfulness cost him badly. It's been two years now. Molly and I are married. We are happy and expecting our first baby boy soon. I might not be a good storyteller, but I've got a great story to tell my son. Well, that's how I met your mother.
When I woke up this morning, I had no idea my life is going to change forever, soon. For the last few months, I'm struggling to earn a single penny. I lost my job during the pandemic. I'm drowning in debt, and my landlord has already given me the final warning. If I don't manage to collect $200 rent today, he will throw me and my pregnant girlfriend out of this house. Till now, we're living on Twinkies and vendor machine snacks. But now, I don't even have money to buy that as well. All of our furniture is gone, as I had to sell them to sustain ourselves in this tough time. My girlfriend Kelly needs proper care and medication in this condition, but I can't do a thing for her. Being disgusted with myself and my life, I left home early today. Now, I am wandering in the streets, looking for one opportunity to earn some cash so that we don't end up in these streets. But fate is not looking up. I am exhausted. I can't tell if I have a fever since last night. After walking for three hours straight, when I didn't see any ray of hope, I sat down on the sidewalks. I felt like I'm going to faint soon. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was Kelly. I picked up and heard her sobbing voice from the other side. Jimmy, the landlord said he'll be coming around 7 p.m. and throw me out of this house. Where are you? Please come home and do something. I could hear the bundled up pain choking her voice, but there was nothing I could do to save the day. I put my hands into my pocket and a damp cigarette, a matchbox. There's no cash in my hand and only $50 are left in my bank account. I don't remember when I passed out. I probably lied on the corner of the sidewalk for hours like a garbage bag. When I woke up, cars passing by the daylight was gone. I quickly looked at my phone and saw it was 6 p.m. already. An hour or more, and my pregnant girlfriend will wander in these streets like a beggar. Such a man I am. Throbbing pain in my head made me nauseous. I vomited on the street right away. Somehow, I still managed to get myself up and look for some water. I took a dingy alley on my left and found a tap. I drank as much as I could. Water is now my only option to suppress hunger. My phone kept ringing. The screen lighted up with missed calls from Kelly, but I didn't pick up once. What will I say to her? I don't have any money, any food, anything. After washing my face, my eyes went to a broken bottle lying on the ground. Yes, that's the only way out now. I can't tolerate the pain anymore. It will be a relief if I end my life and set free. I broke the bottle to get a piece of glass. I said to myself, one deep cut and all my pains will be gone. This is the only way out. I sat down in the dark alley and lit up the last cigarette I had. It tasted a bit funky, but beggars can't be choosers, right? Also, I'll cut my wrists once I finish this smoke, so it doesn't even matter. But what about Kelly? How will she survive on this street without me? Should we commit suicide together? No, I can't say that. She's with my child, a life growing inside of her. Oh God, please show me a way. But I knew no one is going to hear my cry. I remembered how I used to surf the dark web during my high school days while smoking just like this. I still have the Tor browser on my phone, but it has been a long time since I went there. Cluelessly, I opened up the Tor browser and started this old hobby once again. I don't know what I was looking for, but something kept telling me, I will find a solution here, only here. After surfing for 10 to 15 minutes, an ad popped up in the corner. Looking for recluse? Hire hitman with only $50. I don't know what got into me. I clicked on it. A sketchy website opened and started asking for victim details and addresses. Once you fill in the details and make the payment, the hitman will contact you. I saw a way out. I can't let Kelly struggle in this cruel world after my death. She too has no one, just like me. And I can't approach her with this idea of suicide. My only way out is to hire a hitman and set her free from this blood-sucking world. I filled in the details, gave my house address. My hands trembled while I booked murder for the love of my life and my unborn child. Judge me all you want, but I had my back against the wall. As I made the payment, a message popped on the screen. Hitman will contact you in a second. Remember, once you finalize the deal and disconnect this call, 
there'll be no turning back. Why? Why will I turn back now? There's nothing left for us here. It'll be better to end our lives than to spend it in humiliation and poverty forever. A call came from an unknown number, and I picked it up immediately. Hello? The job will be done in a half hour. Is she alone in the house? Y yes Once I disconnect, we will have no contact whatsoever. Is the deal final? I exhaled a deep breath. Tears rolled down my cheek as I tried to say yes. The man with a dense voice spoke again. Is the deal final? I took one deep breath and replied. Yes, the deal is final. The phone got disconnected and I noticed the time was 6.30 p.m. Kelly might be sitting home waiting for me to come back with money and save the day. I put the cigarette butt in the dirty ground and picked up the broken glass to bid goodbye to this world. Life is not the same for all in this world. I looked at my phone one last time. Once the clock strikes seven and our doorbell rings, Kelly will rush to answer me, thinking I've finally returned home. Poor Kelly. She won't be able to guess death is waiting for her on the other side. I wiped my tears and went to slash my wrists with a sharp piece of broken glass. Just then, my phone rang again, but this time it was from my bank. Out of confusion, I picked up saying, Hello? A female agent said from the other side, Mr. Andrews, we are happy to inform you that you have won our lucky draw this month. Congratulations. Your account will be credited with the prize money within hours. What? How, how much money is that? $10,000. You'll be getting the update soon. Thank you for banking with us. Have a nice day. The call disconnected, and the broken glass fell from my hand. What? I have won $10,000? Finally, all our worries will be gone. I sprung up in joy. I couldn't believe this. I looked at the sky and screamed. Miracles do happen. Thank you, God, thank you. But then, my heart dropped into my stomach. It's 6.45. The hitman is on his way to my home. Holy shit. I started to run like a mad dog. What have I done? What was I thinking? I cursed myself while making my way through the busy street. I have to reach home before him or else everything will be over. A few moments back, I had a family, but no money to take care of them. And now, when I have money, my family's life is at stake. I bumped into people while running. Some of them hurled at me with anger, but I didn't care. I need to reach home before seven. I have to. I was sweating like hell. My heart was beating in my throat. I knew the end is near. Each second is a step closer to doom. Oh, Kelly, my love. I can't let you die because of my incompetencies and failures. I was almost near my house when I accidentally tripped on a rock and fell hard on the floor. My ankle twisted and I entwined in pain. I tried to get myself up just when I heard a loud bang and a scream from a woman from my house. I took up my phone with shaking hands. The time was seven o'clock sharp. I saw a guy wearing a hoodie coming quickly from my house and jumping into a camper van parked on the side of the road. The lines of the hitman echoed in my ear. Once the deal is done, there'll be no turning back. I started crying as my world broke apart. I had no guts to walk up to the house and witness Kelly's bloody body lying on the doorstep. I lied there hiding my face into my palm, sobbing like a low light when I heard a familiar voice. Jimmy, what are you doing here? Thank God you came home. I looked up and saw Kelly standing in front of me. Fear was all over my face. I got up in extreme shock and said, you're, you're all right, but that gunshot. I was packing bags when the landlord came. He was pestering me to leave right now, so I went upstairs to get my stuff when suddenly, the doorbell rang, and the landlord answered it. I heard a loud bang, and now he is lying dead on the porch. I don't even know what happened. We have to call 911. Cops came and took our landlord's body. They interrogated us, and I didn't mention a single detail about the hitman. I'm glad instead of Kelly, our landlord opened the door. It scares me to think how ruthless these hitmen are. He didn't even risk confronting someone else. One payment, one kill doesn't matter who he killed and what impact it left. Kelly and I are in a better lifestyle now. 
but I haven't told her anything yet. Every day before going to bed, I try to muster up the courage to tell her the truth, but when I look at her smiling, holding our baby daughter in her arms, I step back. This one secret is going to be with me till the day I die. I never liked my babysitter growing up. It's not like I hated her though. Her name was Sarah, and she didn't really do much aside from lounge around my living room, eating my food while my parents were away. I used to think that being a teenager must have been easy if they could get paid for doing nothing like her. The last time she ever babysat me was when I was around 11. Tim, my little brother, was eight at the time, while my older brother, Thomas, was 13. Thomas had been telling my parents ever since he technically became a teenager that they should let him take care of me and Tim instead of hiring Sarah to babysit. Turns out, my parents really should have listened to him. My parents were going out for the monthly date and called Sarah over to babysit like they had a hundred times before. And just like a hundred times before, Sarah immediately hopped onto the sofa and started playing with her phone the moment my parents left. She only got off of the sofa when it was time to feed us. She microwaved some leftovers and we all chatted at the table during dinner. Or rather, my brothers and I chatted amongst themselves while Sarah texted someone on her phone without paying any attention to us. I assumed it must have been her boyfriend. The few times I've heard her talk on the phone instead of text, she used words like babe or lover boy while making kissy sounds into the phone. Disgusting, I know. I did notice something strange about her that night though. She wasn't quite as distracted as she usually was. Every now and then, she'd actually look up from her phone to look out one of the windows, almost as if she was trying to look out for us like she was supposed to. Once dinner was finished, she got right back onto the couch with her phone while Thomas and I were left to do the dishes. You notice something weird about Sarah? I asked Thomas as we were washing and drawing the dishes we'd been eating from. Not really, why? Well, she keeps looking up from her phone and glancing at the doors and windows. It's like she's actually worried about us, which is weird since it's Sarah. Thomas let out a small chuckle. The house could be on fire and she wouldn't bother to put it out. I'm sure it's nothing. Yeah, you're probably right. I pushed the thought out of my mind and focused on finishing the rest of the dirty dishes. I couldn't stop thinking about it though. Long after Sarah sent the three of us to bed, I lay awake thinking about what could have made the ever apathetic Sarah bother to care about us. I was just about to forget about it when I heard glass shattering from downstairs. The sound woke Tim up and I immediately got out of my bed. What was that? Tim asked as he rubbed his eyes, still half asleep. I don't know, I replied, but I'm going to check it out. You just stay right here. I eased our bedroom door open and crept past Thomas's room past the stairs with my heart beating out of my chest. I was barely able to take two steps when I froze in my tracks at what I saw through the railing. A man was standing in the middle of the living room with a brown cloth bag slung over his shoulder. He had no mask and was walking around like he owned the place rummaging through the drawers and cupboards, trying to find anything valuable. Lying on the ground was one of my parents' vases, shattered into a hundred pieces on the floor. I guessed he must have broken it while trying to stuff it in his bag, which caused the sound that woke us up. Not knowing what to do, I rushed to Thomas' room and opened the door. He was lying awake on his bed, but had his headphones on, so he must not have heard the sound of the vase breaking downstairs. He looked surprised when he saw me and took off his headphones. Hey, you all right there, little bro? There's someone in the house, I blurted out in horror. A seriousness spread across Thomas' face and he immediately grabbed a baseball bat from beside his bed. Go be with Tim and call the police. But, no buts, I'll handle this. I could only assume he must have been trying to prove to himself and our parents that he could take care of me and Tim. Still, I couldn't bear to leave him to face our intruder alone. I texted the police and went to watch from the stair railings as Thomas went to confront the burglar. The burglar was in the middle of emptying a safe when Thomas rushed at him with his baseball bat raised high in the air. He didn't even have time to react before Thomas bashed his head in with the bat. I felt relief washing over me when the man fell onto the floor with blood gushing out of the bruised side of his head. But Thomas didn't stop there. He kept wailing on the burglar, bringing his bat down again and again on his head, his chest, anywhere he could hit. I couldn't tell if it was righteous anger or fearful adrenaline fueling his swings, but he was starting to scare me more than the burglar lying crumpled on the floor. 
Thomas, that's enough! I cried with tears in my eyes. Thomas stopped his baseball bat mid-swing. Had he gone through with it, I was sure that the twitching burglar on the floor would have died. I saw Thomas take a deep breath, which seemed to calm him down. He turned to me saying something, probably an admonishment for not doing what he said. Yet, all I could hear from him was a faint gurgling sound as a knife pierced his throat from behind and exited through the front of his neck. Behind him, holding the knife, was Sarah. Her mouth curled into a vicious snarl and eyes filled with rage. She pulled out the knife and a geyser of blood spurted from the hole in Thomas's neck. He fell to his knees and gripped his open throat, struggling to breathe through the blood that filled his lungs. She didn't even give him a chance. She brought her knife down on him over and over again, screaming obscenities as she did, calling him a brat for hurting her boyfriend. I immediately realized what was going on and sprinted back into my room. I locked the door and cowered under the bed with Tim up until the police arrived in response to my text. Sarah and her boyfriend were both arrested and taken into custody. Thomas was taken out in a body bag. Sarah was never worried about us. I was stupid to think otherwise. She just wanted to make sure none of the neighbors were still awake so that nobody would see her boyfriend once she let him in the house to rob us. I still haven't forgiven my parents for hiring someone like Sarah to watch over us. And honestly, I don't think they'll ever forgive themselves either. I'm scared to shop online because of what happened last time. Due to the COVID situation, I isolated myself like everyone else at home. My company imposed the work of home deal on every worker, and 2020 happened. Even though the lockdown got lifted, I resisted myself from going out. So, my only option was to order my necessities online. Sometimes orders would take time, and sometimes they appear on your doorstep before the expected delivery date. This is what exactly happened to me. On a Friday evening, I was watching a movie with a tub of snacks and a Coke when my doorbell rang. I wasn't expecting anyone and where I stay as neighbors don't mix that well with each other. I got up and looked from the eye hole on the door. A guy dressed as a delivery man stood on the other side with a big box in his hand. I asked, who is it? To which he replied he has come to deliver my package from Amazon. I had to open the door. We finally met, and the man said he is early with my order. I checked the receipt and found out that he was telling the truth. The package indeed belongs to me. I took the cardboard box from his hand and told him to wait outside. I was standing facing my back at him while taking out the money from my wallet when I had a weird feeling. Something was not right, and I couldn't tell why. I turned around immediately and the delivery guy was still standing there like before. His eyes had a piercing look that creeped me out a bit. Anyways, I shrugged it off and went to hand him the money. That's when the situation turned even creepier. While taking the money from me, he gave me a disturbing smirk and said, You smell like my ex-girlfriend. After they dug her up. My body froze in fear and I couldn't decide what should be my next move. My door is wide open, and he can take advantage of me right away, but he didn't. After saying this craziest thing that someone has ever told me, the delivery guy started to walk to his car parked on the driveway. He didn't turn back, didn't stop, just went on his way. I somehow got my shit together and locked the door as soon as he left. What on earth was wrong with this man? I sat quietly for almost an hour trying to make sense of what just happened. When I finally made up my mind that this man is a freak and nothing else, I decided to report him to Amazon. I did what I had to do. They mailed me with an apology and promised to take action on this guy. Meanwhile, I checked all the windows and doors of my house because I had a feeling this isn't over yet. Damn, I was right. I was making dinner in the kitchen when I saw a shadow outside. Someone was walking in my backyard and I could hear grunting noises. I went to the back door and switched on the floodlights, and the creepy guy was back. He was walking back and forth in my backyard with bloodshot eyes and a furious face. Not just that, every time he took a step, he spat on my yard in the most disgusting way possible. Without opening the back door, I screamed. 
Get the hell out of here before I call the cops, you freak! The man stopped walking and turned his head towards me. I've never been scared to this extent in my entire life. He looked like he's ready to slash my throat any time now. He picked up a rock from the ground and threw it on one of the lights, smashing the glass in his first attempt. What the hell, man? Why are you doing this? I screamed again, but he didn't bother to reply. One by one, he shattered all the four lights of my backyard without hesitating for a second. Once he was done, he started to walk towards my back door. I stepped back in fear, thinking he will try to break now. There was a metal vase on the table nearby. I grabbed it to protect myself from what was coming next, but surprisingly, he didn't try to intrude. He just stood in front of my glass window and stared at me while breathing heavily. I called 911 and he didn't even try to stop me. When I finished the call, he leaned on the window, resting his face and palm on the glass and said, If I wanted, I could have done lots of things to you back then, but I didn't. Then why did you report me? Because you're crazy, man. Look at the way you're behaving. Do you call this sanity? You're scaring me. Well, now you have awakened the voices inside my head. They're not always in my control, but I tried my best back then. Still, you reported me for no reason. For no reason? Really? Do you even hear yourself? You said I smell like your ex-girlfriend after she was dug up. What the hell does that even mean? That wasn't me. That was Marvin. He didn't just say that he also told me to do things to you, but did I listen to him? No! Then why did you report me? Why? 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 Oh my god, this man is sick, and he needs medical help. I realize the cops will take time to reach here. Until then, I have to keep him in control so that he doesn't try anything terrifying further. I toned down my voice and said, Look, I'm sorry, I got scared. I'll call the customer service and withdraw my complaint. You can't just withdraw something like this. Tell me, if I cut you open, will I be able to withdraw that? Tell me, you bitch! Is Marvin telling you to do that? The expression on his face changed immediately. He started to sob like a kid, hiding his face inside his palms. After a minute like this, he looked at me and said, I want these voices to stop. I want Marvin to go away. He's ruining my life. I finally realized what is wrong with him. The man is suffering from multiple personality disorder. I slowly walked to the window and told him, Why don't you sit there and calm down? I'm sure the cops will be able to help you. To help the poor guy, I forgot I have gone too close to the window. His face changed all of a sudden and he started to bang on the glass with his head while screaming. You can't help me! You can't help me! I'll cut you open and play with your entrails! I'll make you suffer till your last breath! I screamed at the top of my lungs and turned back to run upstairs. I heard the glass window shattering behind me as I rushed to my room. The man jumped inside and started chasing me like a raging bull. I stormed into my room and went to slam the door behind me when the man inserted his hand from the gap and it got stuck between me. But I was past showing him any kindness. I kept banging the door on his hand while he screamed in pain. Bones started to crack and his and bleed terribly with the door stomping on it repeatedly. The more he screamed, the more I tried to close it. Out of excruciating pain, he moved his hand away and I locked the door in a blink. He kicked and banged on my door while saying obscene things. I collapsed on the ground while praying to God to send the cops as soon as possible. After a minute like this, the banging stopped and everything got quiet. I heard the cop car's sirens outside. That night, two officers searched the entire area near my house and found nothing. The man was gone. They're still looking for him, and I've shifted to my best friend's house. I'm not going back to that house until this man gets arrested. Even if he is mentally ill, I can't risk my life any further. I just hope the cops catch him soon and get him the necessary help before he brutally kills someone.
because if he really killed his girlfriend, he's going to strike again. It happened when I was 13. I was in the eighth grade at the time. I remember the time well as a lot of kids had been going missing from our neighborhood. I remember the first child to go missing. His name was Matthew Smith, and he was our neighbor's son. It gave me a lot of trauma going to school the next day and not seeing one of my classmates. The weird activities had also put our town in fear as the cops had no idea where the kids were or who was taking them. But amidst the horror of it all, there was a ray of hope that appeared as a shining light for us kids. And that ray of hope was Mr. Williams' ice cream truck. Mr. Williams was a man who regularly sold ice cream to our neighborhood. Every time I came back home from school, his ice cream truck would always be packed with kids. And while I believed he was a good man, most things about Mr. Williams was odd. First of all, he didn't drive a normal ice cream truck as the vehicle he drove looked more like an RV than a truck, as it was much bigger than regular ice cream trucks. Secondly, he always had this weird, ecstatic look on his face every time he saw children. As I remember the first time I met him, and he looked at me with wanting eyes like I was a treat. Finally, last weird thing about Mr. Williams was the distinct taste of his ice cream. It's really hard to explain, but you know how vanilla ice cream tastes the same regardless of which store you buy it from? Well, no other ice cream tasted like the one made by Mr. Williams, as whatever ingredients he used gave his own ice cream its own unique taste. And it was still sweet at the same time. I don't know what was in it, but I always craved the distinct taste of his particular ice cream. And I knew I wasn't alone, as every other kid always wanted it too. Visiting his truck soon became a tradition for me, till a weird occurrence that happened one afternoon. I had just come back from school, and as usual, I went to get some ice cream at Mr. Williams' truck. It was pretty crowded, as other kids were rushing to get there, so I decided to wait out the frenzy by going to the back of the truck. As I stood there waiting, I began to hear muffled noises coming from the back of the truck. I got curious, so I started to walk towards the truck so that I could try to make out what the noises were. I reached the door and I was about to place my ear on the door. I heard a loud, guttery scream come from the truck. The scream startled me, so I immediately arched back and fell on the floor. I was confused and scared at the same time as I began to ask myself, why was there a scream coming from the inside of an ice cream truck? At first, I thought Mr. Williams was in trouble, but as I began to think more deeply, I realized that the high-pitched scream belonged to a child. Numerous thoughts started running through my head as I sat down there, too scared to move. Eventually, everything became quiet as the screams of the excited kids rushing for ice cream had died down. As I got up to move, that's when the back of the ice cream truck opened up and Mr. Williams walked out. As he saw me sitting down on the floor, he looked at me with concerned eyes and said, Tracy, isn't it? I was still scared, so I didn't answer. He then continued with, What happened to you? Did you fall down? You look pale, as if you've seen a ghost. I still didn't answer, but I just did the first thing that popped into my mind, and I bolted. I ran all the way to my house, and I locked the door behind me. That night, I went to bed with only one question on my mind. Who was the child who screamed in the back of Mr. Williams' truck? Throughout the following week, I avoided Mr. Williams' truck as I was still a bit scared due to the incident. With every passing day, I delved deeper into my thoughts as I felt my curiosity eating at me. The next day, when I came back from school, I quietly slipped out of the house and I made my way to Mr. Williams' van. As usual, it was really crowded and busy, so I missed all the rowdiness I found my way to the back of the truck. The doors were closed. I stood there for about 30 minutes with my thoughts and I eventually gave up. I didn't hear anything, so I turned my back to leave. And that's when Mr. Williams emerged from the back of the truck. He was taking out what seemed to be trash and as he walked down the streets to where our garbage cans were situated, I noticed the door was slightly left ajar. I knew I had heard nothing while I was waiting, but something told me to take a peek inside just to clear all doubts. So I walked forward and I peeked into the van. It was pretty dark inside and I couldn't see anything, so I decided to get in and take a better look. So I walked in. The inside of the van looked like a small room, 
so I decided to take out my phone and use its torch to look around. At first, I was confused as to what I was seeing, as posters and pictures of little children were plastered all over the walls. There were notes all over the place, and everything seemed wrong about the scene. I began to walk forward when I felt something brush my leg. I looked down to see I had passed a slightly large dog cage. I was about to peer in to see if I was brushed by the paw of the dog, and that's when I saw a little human hand pressed against the cage. I was shocked, so I instinctively arched back. I knew I had seen a child's hand, but I had to make sure, so I summoned the courage and I peered in. That's when I saw a young, gagged child stuffed inside the cage. I held myself from screaming and I began to back away. It didn't take long before I bumped into something. I quickly turned around to see an extra four cages. Each of them held more gagged children inside. Before I could scream, the lights came on and I heard Mr. Williams' voice say, I see you found my children, Tracy. I slowly turned around to see crazy looking Mr. Williams smiling at me. Now that the room was properly lit, saw numerous cages with tired, injured little children who were all gagged and whimpering inside them. What is this, Mr. Williams? So it's you who's taking all the kids away, I blurted out. Taking, he asked. No, no, no. You see, Tracy, these kids came to me. I didn't take anyone. Liar, I screamed back. It's obvious that you took them, but why? Why would you do such a thing? I asked him in tears. Why would I? He shouted back at me, obviously frustrated. Why would life? Why would life give the beautiful gift of children to everyone but me? I'd be a great father. I've always loved kids, but I can't have them. It hurt me deeply, but I wasn't going to bitch about it, so I decided to collect them. To take them by force. And as you can see, I have amassed quite the collection. He spoke like the children weren't living, breathing human beings. He spoke like they were memorabilia and it, it was one of the most horrible and horrific things I had ever heard. When he was done speaking, a tense silence filled the van. I tried to move forward, but he blocked my way. I stuttered. But pl please let me go. And that's when he replied, I'm afraid I can't let you do that. You see, I've had my eye on you for a while now, Tracy, and I think you'd make a great addition to my collection. And before I could reply to the morbid statement, he lunged at me. I instinctively threw my phone at him. It hit him in the eye and he began to scream. With no hesitation, I bolted and I ran all the way home. When I told my mom everything that happened and she immediately called the cops. When the cops arrived, they couldn't find Mr. Williams. No one could, as he had completely vanished. The incident traumatized me for the rest of my childhood, but with a lot of therapy, I moved on. Although I always jump at the sound of an ice cream truck as I know Mr. Williams is still out there collecting children and spreading his ice cream, Before I begin, I would like to say that what you're about to hear is not an experience of mine, as it happened to a man called Alexei Ivan, my grandfather. And this is a recollection of what he told me and my brother one fateful afternoon. I remember I was 17 at the time, and me and my little brother, who was 16 at the time, were bickering about something. I remember I blurted out, I hate you, Tom, and my grandfather, who was sitting on the couch, then turned to me and sternly said, Don't you ever say that, boy, if you only knew what you have. I remember being confused and I asked, What are you talking about, Grandpa? And that's when he sat me and my brother down and he said, Let me tell you a story of how my little brother saved my life. He started the story by telling us about the time during World War II when he and his little brother, Andre Ivan, were soldiers during the Siege of Leningrad. It was on the 12th of October, 1941, and we had been surrounded by the Germans for about a month. The Germans had taken the city me and my little brother lived in. We didn't know it at the time, but Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, was just about to enter true hell for the next two years. Now we knew Hitler was trying to starve us out, and it didn't fully hit us until the third month. 
Our parents were dead, and it was just us both and our little sister. We were both drafted as soldiers, so we asked an old female friend to take care of our little sister. We knew since we were soldiers, we weren't always going to be with her. For the first six months, we watched things get from bad to worse as things weren't letting up. The German soldiers were still holding up the South, and the Finnish military, who were under the Germans, had blocked the North. There was no way out. Me and my brother were moved to the trenches since we were part of the Soviet soldiers. We stayed in the trenches for weeks. The weeks seemed like months, and it didn't take long before we were knee-deep in corpses. Starvation set in, and soon enough, death looked like a far better solution than what we were going through. But even through all this, I took solace in the fact that I had my little brother Andre with me through it all. I remember him telling me, we are Ivans, even hell isn't enough to take us down. I laughed at what he said and we cheered. But come winter, we'd know something worse than hell. November 1941 was the beginning of something worse than hell for the citizens of Leningrad, as winter had arrived, and with it, a different kind of suffering came too. Communication had been cut off and food was reduced to crumbs of bread per day. For us soldiers, we had to find a way to survive. So we began to eat anything we could find, from birds to lizards. We ate anything we could get our hands on. Our group had gotten a bit bigger as we met and made some other friends during our time in the trench. Their names were Anton, Boris, Cheslav, and Dima. We were making our way across the trench when we saw a man and his two sons eating meat. Something was odd as it was impossible to see meat in this city as we were closed off. And at that moment, meat seemed like a thing of myth. As they saw us, they began to run and hide, and that's when Anton raised his gun and said, They're cannibals! Instinctively, we all raised our guns. We had been recently receiving reports of cannibalism, and we were told to bring those who we caught. We later found out that the man had killed his wife and fed her body parts to his two sons for food. We were told to shoot him down, as that was the punishment for cannibals who killed and ate people. As the months passed by, rats and birds were getting hard to find, and the cases of cannibalism were reaching the thousands. I once came across a child eating the corpse of his dead father. The government had classified the ongoing cannibalism cases into two, the person eating cannibals and the corpse eating cannibals. The cannibals who ate people were to be put to death, and the ones who ate corpses were to be thrown in prison. The numbers continued to rise as the siege carried out, and when it was nearing the second year, madness had engulfed the whole city. Me and my brother managed to stay sane by eating any bugs, roots, or flowers we could find. It had been two months since we'd seen our friends as we were sent far down the trench. Eventually, we started making our way back to regroup, and I remember my brother Andre was looking extremely sick. I remember him saying, I don't feel too good, brother as we walked and made our way back to the familiar base in the trenches. I remember telling him, Be strong, Andre. We are Ivans. We'll find the others and regroup, and by doing that, we will have strength in numbers. It took us two days to get over there, but we made it. The place was desolate and empty, but we were hearing sounds coming from inside the base. I remember calling out to our friends, Anton, Boris, Jeslav, Dima. We were answered with nothing but silence. That's when I heard my little brother say, They aren't here, Alexei. I think the only solution we have now is to lie down and die. Hearing my brother give up was the most painful thing to hear. And as I was about to leave, four things attacked me. They looked like humans, but their skins were gray and their eyes were bloodshot. They immediately began to sink their teeth into my skin. I reached for my gun, but it was knocked out of my hand. I felt their teeth dig deep into my skin as they started to tear off my flesh. I fell to the floor and I had to accept my fate. But that's when my little brother began to pull them off me. He began to fight them off and he gave me a chance to escape. As I stood to my feet, I could feel myself bleeding as I had lost a lot of blood. I wanted to help him fight, but I had lost my strength. I stood there transfixed. And that's when I heard my little brother Andre scream, Run, Alexei! Can't leave you! I replied as I braced myself to fight. As my brother struggled, he then began to shout. So what do you want for both of us to die here? I need you to live, Alexei. You need to live for our little sister, Irina. And you need to live for me. You've taken care of me throughout my life, and it's my turn to return the favor. 
Run, brother! Run! But before he finished his last sentence, I saw one of his attackers bite down on his neck. As he struggled to speak, he began to lose his footing, and as he fell down, I watched them tear my little brother apart. The pain of watching him die was less than the pain of letting him down. So I picked up my gun, and as they were tearing his corpse apart, I began to shoot and kill each and every one of them. After a while, all that was left was silence. As I began to dig a grave with my own two hands, and I buried what remained of my little brother's corpse, I cried deeply as I stayed there mourning. After a while, I composed myself, and I decided to fulfill my purpose to him, and I swore to live. I looked at the things that had attacked and killed my brother, and as I recognized them, a horrific realization dawned on me. The men who laid on the floor were our friends Boris, Cheslav, Dima, and Anton. I couldn't recognize them before as they looked completely different. Their skin had changed color and their eyes were bloodshot red. But as their corpses calmly laid on the floor, I could make out their faces. The pain was too much as I considered these men brothers too. But the siege had driven them mad and they had long passed their sanity. The pain was too much for my heart, but I pushed on. I had managed to survive the remaining year and I pushed on through another five months. I will never forget the day the siege was lifted as I cried in honor of my brother. I immediately went back to the city and when I got there, I found out my sister, Irina, was dead. Through the remaining years, my life gradually began to lose meaning. And as I was about to give up, one of my cousins called and she said she heard what happened. She said that she was moving to the United States and asked if I wanted to come with her and start afresh. I hesitated, but I remembered the promise I made to my little brother. So I decided to live. I moved here and I met your grandmother about three years later. Eventually, we gave birth to a wonderful little girl who grew up to be your mother. My grandpa then looked directly at us and said, See you boys, cherish each other, because our time on this earth isn't guaranteed. And the only reason I'm alive today is because I decided to live for my brother. So you both should live for each other too. My grandfather Alexei Ivan died about two months after he told me and my brother this story. And I decided to share the same story to everyone who's hearing this. It's in memory of the greatest grandfather who ever lived, and I'm glad to know that wherever he is, he is happily reunited with his brother Andrei and his sister Irina. Alexei Ivan, 1914 to 2007. It has been three years since I married my high school girlfriend, Camilla. It was like love at first sight with her. Our families didn't approve much because she is Asian and I'm American. Still, we stuck together. We saved up and got jobs to make our life better. Right now, we have a solvent lifestyle, but in the beginning, we didn't have much. We were ready for the struggle and to keep things low yet happy living, we did fun things most cost effectively. And that's when this incident happened. I worked in the garage while she worked as a waitress in a small cafe at the beginning years of our married life. Like every newlywed, I wanted to take her for a honeymoon, so we saved up and decided to go snowboarding in the mountains. A guy in my garage told me about this old house that his brother rents. The house is located in the valley of the mountains. The only catch is, you have to share the space with another couple. I asked Camille about going there, and she hesitated at first, but looking at our option of going somewhere really serene and beautiful, that too, under our budget, seemed more lucrative. We did as we planned. My sister lent me her car, and we set off on a dreamy week amidst the snow. Camille and I were so happy. She was singing and laughing during the entire ride. The smile on her face lit up my world. After two hours, we finally started driving up the mountain. The white snow spread around us like vanilla ice cream dazzled our eyes. I even stopped the car and took pictures with Camilla. She played with the snow while I went on clicking photos of her. When we reached the location, we saw a wooden two-storied house standing under the long pine trees that were sleeping under the blanket of snow. Wow. Isn't it beautiful? Camilla said. Yes, it is, I replied with a smile. I walked to the porch and took out the key from the hanging plant pot as mentioned by the owner. It seemed like we were the first couple to arrive because otherwise we would have found the house open. 
I unlocked the door with a key and we got inside, taking our luggage. The house was moderately nice. There wasn't much furniture inside except a big couch near the fireplace and two armchairs. The living room was cozy and cold at the same time. Two bedrooms lied in the house, one downstairs and another on top of it upstairs. We were told that the top one is booked beforehand by the second couple, so we were bound to live under them. Our room had a double bed, a small table, and two chairs near a wide glass window. The rest of the valley was visible from that window. A night sky full of stars was an added miracle to the view outside the window. When will the other couple arrive? Camila asked. The owner said today only, maybe they're still on their way. I told her to freshen up and went to light up the fireplace in the living room. By the time I managed to start a fire on the damp logs, snowfall started outside. We brought canned tunas and ready to cook meals with us. I already knew there won't be many amenities to avail here, so we came prepared. I lit up a smoke and sat on the couch, just when the main door wide opened and a gust of cold wind entered the house. Well, hello there. A man in his late 50s entered the room with a pale, tall woman. The woman was quite old too, but her face looked uncanny dark with red lipstick. She was wearing a lot of makeup that even in those dim lights, I could spot easily. The artificial pink blush on her cheek made her look frequently weird at first appearance. The elderly couple closed the door behind them and I said, Hello, I'm Jack. You must be the other couple sharing this cottage with us. The husband smiled and replied, Nice to meet you, Jack. I'm Dave and this is my beautiful wife, Linda. Where is your better half, young prince? The woman asked in a squeaky voice. Before I could reply to her, the address, young prince, kind of startled me. I told them my wife is freshening up in the room. They looked at each other and said, if we don't mind, we can all have dinner together. At that point, I had no other option than to say yes. We are going to share this place with Dave and Linda for a week, so it's better to mix up and maintain a good rapport. They went upstairs and locked the door. I quickly walked to our room to tell Camilla about our neighbors. Camilla was wearing a beautiful blue long dress. She looked like a dream in that attire. I couldn't help but to go and kiss her. After sharing a brief passionate moment, I told her the other couple has arrived and they have invited us to join them for dinner. She asked me what they are like, to which I explained all details about our first interactions. I even told her the woman called me Young Prince, which kind of unsettled me. Camilla laughed about it and the woman couldn't help but flirt with me. We came out hearing a knock on our door. Dave and Linda were sitting in the living room. They have moved a table in front of the couches and created a dinner setup. Camilla and I sat at the table and shared our food with them. Things started quite all right, but as time passed, I realized something is very wrong with these two. Linda wasn't at all talking to Camilla. Her attention was on me. She was flirting with me in the creepiest way possible. Like, I was having a bite when she said, Oh, you got some ketchup on your lips. And without waiting for my response, she wiped my lips with her bony fingers. I could see Camilla getting disturbed by Linda's behavior as well. Not just that, I even saw her licking off that ketchup from her fingers while staring at me. On the other hand, Dave was constantly checking out my wife and it was the most awkward, uncomfortable dinner of our life. After a point, Camilla said, I'm feeling tired. Also, we have to get up early to go snowboarding. She got up with an angry face and said, Jack, are you coming? I got up at that second when Linda did something unexpected. She got up and came extremely close to my face. She looked me in the eyes like a psycho and said, I didn't know you're a puppet of this woman, young prince. Camilla couldn't keep it in anymore. She stormed in my direction and pushed Linda saying, back off, this is my husband and you are crossing your limit. Maybe you should mind your age. Go spend time with your husband if you have any interest in them. I tried hard not to laugh, but my girl was on fire that night. As soon as we got inside our room, we had a night of amorous lovemaking. As I slept hugging Camilla to my chest, I still couldn't forget the bloodshot, angry face of Linda after she got insulted. But she had it coming, so yeah. Don't remember what time it was, but we woke up hearing loud sounds of furniture breaking and glass shattering in the house. What was that? Camilla got up all scared. I could hear Linda screaming. She was screaming and rampaging the entire house in furious anger. We also heard Dave's voice trying to calm her down saying, please stop it, enough now. But Linda went on behaving like a lunatic. 
I slowly walked to our door and was about to put my ear on the door to listen to what she was up to when the sound stopped. She just stopped screaming all of a sudden. I placed my ear on the door and tried to listen more carefully. All of a sudden, someone stabbed a huge sharp knife on the old wooden door, cutting through the wood like butter. Luckily, my head was not on the same spot where the knife struck, and Linda spoke from the other side of the door. Did I get you, my young prince? <laughs> Camilla screamed in horror, and I backed off immediately. Linda went on kicking and stomping our door while cursing us like hell. We knew we won't be able to hold this door for long, and that's exactly what happened. She kicked hard and the dusty old door collapsed on the floor. Linda stood in front of us like a crazy psycho. I could see her wrinkled old face as she had no makeup on this time. She looked at me and then at Camilla. Within a fraction of a second, she picked up speed and ran towards Camilla with a knife in her hand. I jumped and got in between her while her husband grabbed her from behind. She screamed and kicked in the air. I'll slit your throat and cut your face off, you skinny bitch! Her husband somehow dragged her out of that room, and without wasting a single second more, Camilla and I picked up our bags and stormed out of that house. The sun was rising, and we could see the rays lighting up the dark valley. We drove out of that place and spent the rest of our honeymoon in a hotel. We didn't hesitate to spend on a secure stay to get some privacy after that toxic experience. Don't know what happened to Linda and Dave, but I hope we never meet them again. I used to work as a cleaning guy in an asylum. The asylum was set to hold some of the extremely violent patients around the state. The patients were kept in a different wing. Right next to the main building, there was an underground facility that was always under high alert security. Not many people were allowed there. No visitors ever stepped in, and it was evident the patients who stayed there were completely cut off by their friends and family. That wing was assigned to our senior staff, Jonathan, who has been working there from the beginning years. He used to share many creepy incidents that he experienced in that wing. So in my mind, I always had this idea that the Red Alert Wing is a hellhole of screaming lunatics threatening to take your life. One day during working hours, we heard an ambulance coming towards the asylum building. We all went outside and saw two security guards carrying Jonathan on their shoulders. The paramedics took him to the hospital and we came to know he had a stroke while working in the red alert area. Even though there was no sign of injury on his body, I could sense something was unnatural about his sudden stroke. I asked one of the security, how did it happen? He shrugged his shoulders with a confused face and said, well, he was cleaning near cell nine when we heard a ruckus. We rushed there and he was lying unconscious on the floor and some patients were laughing like maniacs seeing this poor man die. Uh, this place is filled with freaks, crazy seek people. I could see the disgust on his face. Honestly, we all knew that the patients here were not in their sensible state of mind, but still, the cruelty and inhuman behavior did scare each one of us to go near them, even in daylight. A spot opened to work in the Red Alert facility, but none of the cleaning staff agreed to go there. The manager doubled the pay, and I couldn't stop myself from grabbing the deal. I needed money more than anyone else at that point, so I said I will do it. While handing me the charts of the cells, he said with a serious voice, Whatever happens, always stay away from the bars of these cells. You'll find details of patients on the chart, so act accordingly after studying their profile in detail. That night, I went home and sat down with the chart with a beer and some pasta. I found out there were 13 cells in that wing with 10 patients at present. Six of them were male and four of them female. Each one is accused of committing violent crimes in their feet of mental instability. For example, the guy in cell number one is a 35-year-old man who crashed into a birthday party going to his neighbor's house and tried to burn the house down. A woman in cell number seven strangled her 85-year-old mother in her sleep. The more I read, the more chills appeared on my skin. Among all of them, the 50-year-old man in cell number nine was termed as the most violent of all. There was very little information about how he ended up here, but I recalled it was the same cell outside which Jonathan was found unconscious. I won't lie, but that night, I had a terrible dream. I saw I was laying on the floor of the red alert wing and all the patients were laughing like maniacs and pulling my entrails out my cut open stomach. Anyways, after very little sleep, I woke up to join my new shift. 
I drank a steaming cup of strong coffee and some toast and set out for work. Needless to say, I was damn nervous. For the first time in the last three years, I was going to step inside the red alert wing. After passing through three iron bar doors, I finally reached in front of the long corridor decked up with cells on my left. I could hear screams and laughs at the same time. Honestly, my heartbeat got faster as I realized whatever I have heard about this place so far is true. It was worse than hell. The violent patients jumped and grabbed the cell bars as long as they saw a new guy trolling in the corridor with a mop. They screamed and cursed me with slang that almost made me bleed through my ears. I was sweating like a dog and my hands were trembling at the same time. The bars were the only thing that was keeping me separate from these hell hounds. One by one, I crossed each cell and their screams started to settle in. I started adjusting to the shift on my own. I could see the security guy near the gate. He said, don't worry, you will get used to it. Think of them as mad pigs chained up in barns. I didn't like the way he addressed these people, even though they were acting like lunatics. Suddenly, the woman in cell seven spat on the ground looking at the security guy and said, your mother was a pig and you are her little piglet. <laughs> the guy got ferocious and without giving her any warning, jumped to her cell and hit her fingers grasping the bars with his baton. She screamed in pain and I saw blood bursting out from her broken nails. She backed out immediately and started screaming like a lunatic and cursing the guy from her cell. He laughed in cruel joy. Hey, what are you doing? These are people, man. You can't be physical like this. Shut up, do your job. You're here to clean this shit and fuck out after you're done. I felt very insulted by his words. I didn't stress this matter anymore, but decided to lodge complaints against him later. After work, I went to the medical staff and told them about his behavior. I got shocked by their lack of response. Some of them even said the guy did what he had to do. The people of the Red Alert Wing deserved it. I can't say if they're right, but one thing I surely believe is, we are no one to decide who deserves what. These people are already living in hell, and some of them had it coming too, but being physical with them is straight cut abuse. But there wasn't much I could do. After all, I was just a cleaning guy. When I returned home, something weird stuck in my mind. All this time, I didn't think about it, but now it came to me. I remembered how every patient came at me and screamed, but only the cell nine patient didn't. Cell nine was dark. It seemed like whoever was inside covered the small hole with a piece of cloth to block the minimal sunlight that came during the daylight. And whoever was inside hid in that darkness. The next day, when I went to work, I made up my mind to take a good look at cell nine. Today as well, I found the cell completely dark. The lights don't hit until it's 5 p.m. I look to figure out if someone is sitting inside that cell with the cover of the window tilted down slightly and a sunbeam entered the cell. In that little light, I could see a pair of bloodshot eyes staring directly at me. The patient inside cell nine was watching me this entire time and I had no idea. I can't tell you how creeped out I felt at that moment. I took steps back and that man slowly crawled out from the darkness and sat near the cell bars. I finally saw him. That 50 year old most violent patient of the Red Wing. He was the scariest looking old man I have ever come across in my entire life. He smiled at me without breaking eye contact and said, you pity us? I started mopping the floor and replied, I think what the guard did was wrong. And what about what that woman did? Don't tell me you haven't read the charts before coming here. That's not for me to decide what she deserves. Well then, who decides that? I didn't say anything. Finished my work quietly that day. I don't exactly remember the time, but I woke up hearing my phone ring. It was one of my colleagues. He worked the night shifts. As I answered, I heard him panting in fear. Mike, what is it? <laughs> He's dead. What? Who? The security guy in the red alert wing. He was doing a double shift today. I went to offer him coffee and saw a trail of blood on the entire corridor. He's dead and he's gone. Mike, I'm not getting what you're trying to say. Oh my God, what will we do now? Before I could ask him more, the phone got disconnected. Out of panic, I drove down to the asylum and met with horrible news. Cop cars were flooding outside the gate. A group of cops were searching the asylum and interrogating the night workers. It came to know 
the 50-year-old man of cell 9 was cutting the bars of the window every night. Now I realized why he covered it during the day. No one knows how he got hold of the knife and made this impossible escape a success. But before leaving the facility, he stood in front of his cell bar and called out to that security guy. As soon as he came to hit the man, the man slashed his throat and clapped in joy as the security guard bled to death in front of his eyes. He is free again, hiding somewhere, or planning something even more sinister these times. I wish I could know more about him and be able to stop him, but I don't think he will ever come after me too. Will he? <laughs> My girlfriend Sally and I went on a trip to Alaska after we graduated from college. We couldn't afford to go anywhere fancy though, and we didn't want to. We were both outdoorsy types and wanted to get in touch with the wilderness after spending the past four years stuffed into tiny dorm rooms in the city. We tried looking for cheap resorts at first, but ended up renting a small bed and breakfast cabin in the mountains where we had easy access to the hiking trails we wanted to go on. The booking website showed the host to be a small family with a mother, a slightly overweight father, and two adult sons who were posing in front of their wooden cabin. Staying there was cheaper than most of the resorts we looked up, and since the host lived in the middle of the mountains, we could probably ask them for help if we had any trouble on the trail. It seemed like a win-win. Soon after getting out of the airport, my girlfriend and I booked a cab to the mountain the cabin was on and hiked the rest of the way. We had to follow a faint dirt trail that led us up the mountains past dense snow-covered forests. A heavy layer of snow made the trail harder to decipher at times, but we managed and got to the cabin right as the sun was setting. As much as we appreciated the views we got to see during the hike, it left us panting with exhaustion by the time we finally arrived. I knocked on the door to the cabin while my girlfriend caught her breath and waited for the hosts to arrive. About a minute later, the door opened to reveal the two adult sons we saw posing for the cabin on the website. They looked a little worse for wear than they were on the website photo. There were wrinkles on their face, and they weren't there before and they seemed a little bit thinner than they should be. Nevertheless. They both welcomed us warmly inside and fixed us some hot coffee to drink upon seeing how tired we were. The older brother introduced himself as Rick, while the younger brother introduced himself as Dan. They led us to a large dining table next to a roaring fireplace with a pot hanging above it. You came just in time, Rick told us. We just finished making dinner for the night. Would you care to join us? Sounds great, Sally said. What's on the menu? Dan gently lifted up the pot that hung above the fireplace and placed it on the dining table. Bear stew. We shot them ourselves a few days ago. Have you two ever had bear meat before? No, I can't say that we have, I told them. But I'm looking forward to trying it. Me too, my girlfriend agreed. The four of us sat together and ate what is still the most delicious meal of my life. We chatted as we ate and eventually the topic of family came up. When we asked them where their parents were, they told us that their parents were currently staying in a nearby town. An out-of-season blizzard had come by not so long ago, and that's what made them decide it was better for their parents there instead of out in the wilderness with them. Rick made a comment on how lucky we were for the blizzard to pass just in time for us to arrive. Had we been there a few days earlier, there wouldn't have been anything but snow and wind for us out there. When dinner was finished, my girlfriend and I complimented our host for the delicious meal and went to the bedroom upstairs for some much-needed rest. They seem like they're such nice people, aren't they? My girlfriend said once we were alone in each other's arms. Yeah, they seem like lovely people. Their parents are lucky to have caring kids like them. Yeah, they sure do. I hope our kids turn out like them. Yeah, yeah I hope they do too. Wait, what? That was when she dropped the bombshell on me. She was pregnant. She wanted it to be a surprise, and God damn it, it was. I was shocked by the news, but at the same time, I was overjoyed at the thought of becoming a father. We spent all night talking about names we'd want for our children until we fell asleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of Rick and Dan arguing to each other. I was confused because it sounded as if they were talking right in front of our bedroom for some reason and only caught brief snippets of their conversation. No, we can't, I heard Rick's voice say. That was a one-time thing. We can't risk doing it again. Come on, replied Dan's voice. You're curious too, aren't you? I didn't bother to listen on the rest of their conversation. It was probably just them fighting over normal brotherly stuff anyway, so I fell back to sleep. The next day I woke up and decided to go on a hike in the mountains. My girlfriend wanted to join in, but she still seemed tired and I was worried for our unborn child, 
so I told her to stay put in the cabin for a little while longer. She reluctantly agreed, and we both had breakfast with Rick and Dan before I left for my hike. We ate the same delicious stew from the other day. All of us agreed that the bear meat was to die for. Then I was off for my hike to appreciate the outdoors. I tried to enjoy myself and take in the beautiful scenery, but my mind couldn't help but wander back to the thoughts of my pregnant girlfriend. I was afraid that she'd need help while I was out and I wouldn't be able to help her. What kind of man would I be if I wasn't there for the mother of my child when she needed me? In the end, I decided that it would be best if I returned to the cabin to be with my girlfriend and go hiking again with her once she's rested. When I returned to the cabin, I eased open the door as quietly as I could. I wanted to surprise my girlfriend with my return to get back at her for dropping the bombshell on me the night before. Instead, I was the one to be surprised and horrified by what I saw. Lying on the dining table I was eating at just that morning was my girlfriend. Her throat was slit and she'd been cleanly cut open in the middle of her stomach. Rick and Dan stood over her, holding butcher knives that they used to slice her body into meaty cuts as if she were some common farm animal. All the while, their mouths drooled like a dog staring at a steak it couldn't wait to eat. Dan tore something pink and small out of her stomach and walked over to the fireplace. As he opened the lid of the pot hanging over the fireplace to put it in, I realized with horrified disgust what it was. It was the three-month-old fetus of my child. They were planning to eat my girlfriend and our unborn child after cooking them in the same pot they used for food just the other day. I didn't want to see any more of it. I ran away and followed the trail back to the nearest town where I called the police. When the police raided the cabin, they found the chopped up body of my girlfriend in the freezer. Though, she wasn't the only one they found there. Being kept there alongside her were the similarly chopped up bodies of Rick and Dan's parents. The meat in the stew they served us wasn't bare at all. It was the flesh of their own parents whom they killed for food while they were starving in the blizzard that just passed a few days before I arrived. Rick and Dan were nowhere to be seen. I guess they must have been scared off when I didn't return from my hike. To this day, I wonder if they're still out there, killing people, just to feed their twisted hunger. <laughs>